Good morning to all of you from Europe and a warm afternoon to all of us from Singapore. Daniel, all yours. Yeah, thank you. So how is the sound? Because I, uh, I'm a bit afraid. I just started a lot of work uh, next to my door. So. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> so, well, I, I'm grateful for, for uh, for the organizers to, to set up this uh, beautiful meeting, very pleasant. So thank you, Andreas, Rudo, and Francesca for setting it up. So I'd like to discuss indeed the quantum spin systems and the, the nematic phase, which is present there. So let me briefly review the setting for quantum spins. So the Hilbert space is a tensor product of C3. There are standard spin operators on C3, satisfying the usual uh, spin commutation relations. And uh, just for, for the notation, so SXI, I is for the direction of the spin, one, two, three, and X is the site. So I apologize for, for, for instance, I mean, we had the similar setting in Pitaki's talk, but the X was for the direction of the spin, and <laughs> the I was for the, for, for the lattice site. So X is for the lattice site, and I the direction of spin. And SXI is the spin at site X. So it's a tensor product with the identity everywhere else. And if we look at the general SU2 invariant Hamiltonians, they have this form. So general Hamiltonians with nearest neighbor spin interactions, but with SU2 invariant interactions. So the interactions are a linear combinations of these usual Heisenberg interactions and this Sx times Sy to the square. So for those of you who are familiar to spin one half systems, you, you never see such a thing because this operator is actually equal to a linear combination of the identity and this operator here. So that there is no need to, to consider it. But for spin one system, systems, this is a, a bit different. So the general SU2 invariant interaction is a linear combination of these two operators. And there is no need to look at further powers of Sx times Sy, because they could be written in, in terms of linear combinations of these two and the identity. And the Gibbs state is the usual Gibbs state. So one over the partition function, the trace on the Hilbert space of the operator A, exponential minus beta H. So the question is to, to understand the low temperature phase diagram in dimension three. So there's some motivation, so let me review briefly. I'm not exactly an expert, so I hope you won't answer too, uh, ask too many questions for, for this. But this model, this modelization is relevant for, for the Bose-Einstein condensates of integer spin atoms. And there are some components where the magnetic properties are unconventional and are expected to be related to, to, to nematic behavior. So there is this component, NIJA2S4. Another one is, um, is this lithium based component. So here is the, the phase diagram. So remember the, um, the, the Hamiltonian, which is the sum of J1 times this uh, first operator and J2, the second one. So J1 is uh, in this axis and J2 here. So, so this is the low temperature or, or ground state space diagram. It only things only depend on, on the direction, I mean, the respective directions of J1 and J2, because everything can be scaled by, by beta otherwise. So it turns out that there are two special directions where the system, I mean, the, the Hamiltonian has more than SU2 symmetry, it has actually SU3 symmetry. So these directions where J1 is equal to J2, and these directions where J1 equals zero. And it's quite, natural to expect that since the, the symmetry of the system changes dramatically from SU2 to SU3 and then back to SU2, there can be something in, in the phase diagram. And indeed, these are expected to be the, the boundaries separating the four phases. So in these directions, you have a, the Heisenberg ferromagnet, and so you have a ferromagnetic state. But then in between, you have a spin nematic phase, the, this direction here is actually the, the direction that uh, Pinaki was discussing. That's the anti-ferromagnetic model. So this is expected to be 
anti-ferromagnetic with nail order. And in fact, this anti-ferromagnetic phase is expected to extend in the whole yellow region. And then there is a very interesting but complicated staggered pneumatic phase here, um, which I'm not going to discuss. In fact, I, I plan to discuss really this spin pneumatic phase. So let me say a few words about uh, the spin pneumatic phase. So it's motivated by liquid crystals. So you probably know that liquid crystals are formed by very long molecules. And at low temperature, when you have these long molecules packed with one another, you get a system which uh, is still translation variant, but the, the invariance under rotation is broken. At the same time, when you look at, the, um, at these molecules, they can point up or down. In fact, there is no preferred direction. So, so, so then the low temperature phases are characterized by a preferred axis, but not preferred direction. So, so spin pneumatic phases are kind of analog to, to, to this, and they are expected to display the a decay of usual spin correlations. So if you take the, just the spin-spin correlations in <clears throat> whatever direction, so i is one, two, or three, this is expected to, to decay to zero as the distance between this side zero and, and the side x go to infinity. At the same time, if you look at uh, something which, <coughs> which measures, um, I mean, the orientation, but is not canceled by this plus minus uh, symmetry. So, so you can look at these kind of expectations. So, so the expectation of this product minus the expectation of the first, the expectation of the second. So this is the truncated correlation function. Um, oh, I meant not going to zero as X goes to infinity. So one expects that this uh, correlation function does not tend to zero. So the two point, the spin-spin correlation function goes to zero, but this one does not. And in addition, we expect that the low temperature gives states are uh, indexed by axes in S2, uh, which technically means also the mathematically it's the projected sphere PS2. So it's the sphere, uh, two-dimensional sphere, which means that uh, that's the one we can see in three dimensions, where we identify two opposite points. So this is uh, what we expect for, for this phase of the spin pneumatic phase. So one can do some rigorous results uh, using reflection positivity because it turns out that half the spin pneumatic region is reflection positive. But I'm going to, to skip this, um, this part. So what I'm going to, to do is to, to use a, a loop representation in order to, to get some, uh, some insights of the phases. So here we have uh, these loop representations for, for this um, model. So this is the same model instead of J1, I'm writing this letter U, and the J2 always takes value one. So, so it turns out that uh, the, the loop representation works for, for, for these parameters, which actually sweep the whole pneumatic region. And, uh, and here you have uh, the representation, I mean, the picture of a representation. So this is the, the lattice. So here we have four sides. And on top of each edge, we have a time interval from zero to beta. So the vertical extension is, is beta. And then we, I mean, using a standard Schroeder product expansion or um, Feynman cats or space time expansion, one can uh, recognize all the terms in such a way that they have these uh, geometric pictures. So, so what appears are these double bars and these crosses. And for configuration double bars and crosses, we can look at loops by following the trajectories. A double bar means that we cross and change direction, vertical directions, and then we cross and we go down here. We have periodic boundary conditions along the vertical direction. So then we go down here and then back. And here we close the, the loop. So here we have two loops. We have the blue and the red one. And this is another picture. The underlying graph is not one dimensional, but just to, to show that it works in arbitrary, I mean, for arbitrary finite graphs. So, the, so, so then it turns out that the relevant probability measure is this measure for 
the occurrence of double bars and, and crosses, which is just Poisson point process, everything weighted by three to the number of loops. And this represents the partition function. And the spin correlations can be written in terms of correlations between loops. So <clears throat> what matters here is really that um, we have this quantum spin system, we have these notions of loops, and then we can look at the realization of these crosses and double bars and look at the lengths of the loops in decreasing order. And let's divide all those lengths by the maximal length, which is B type times the number of sites. Uh, I'm also measuring the, the number of, I mean, the length of the loops by just the vertical components. So, so, so all those numbers are between zero and one. <coughs> and for all omega, the sum of those numbers are one by construction. So here we get a random partition of the, the unit interval. We have positive numbers decreasing, the sum add to one. Question, what should we expect in a large system for, for, for these numbers? So if you take one realization, you get a partition, another realization, you get another partition. So here you have uh, new, the, the results of numerical experiments. You have four different realizations of these Poisson point processes and these crosses and double bars for the same parameters. So it's the same beta, the same parameter u. And what we see in this one, for, for instance, is that here you have the length of the largest loop, which is quite large because divided by the volume, we still get something positive. We have the second largest, third largest, and so on. And, they, and we have a lot of long loops of the order of the volume with an accumulation point on this point here. Here you get a, another realization. We can see that the longest loop is a bit longer than before. The second longest is a bit smaller. And we still have many of them. And again, with an accumulation point exactly on this point. By the way, here it's all black because we have lots of vertical ticks. So in fact, all of those loops here are so small. I mean, are of order one, the lens. But when we divide by the volume, we get the, the ticks to be so close that we don't see, see things anymore. So the, the picture, and I mean, something interesting is that this accumulation point here is the same as here. And you can see two more realizations. They always have the same accumulation point. So, so what we see is that this random partition has some typical behavior. It consists of long loops and short loops. And the, the amount of long loops and short loops is, is almost surely the same. It satisfies a lot of large numbers. But at the same time, from one realization of long loops to another, things change a lot. And the conjecture is that this still has some kind of um, well order. I mean, it is well understood in the sense that this random partition is described according to the Poisson de Richelieu distribution, which I'm not going to, to go into details, but it's a measure on random partition, which came from mean field considerations. So it's a bit surprising, but here we have a, a three dimensional system with a lot of spatial correlations, but it turns out that the long loops are described by this mean field behavior in an exact way. It's not approximately equal to, to Poisson de Richelieu. It's, it's expected that in the infinite volume limit, uh, the Poisson de Richelieu is exactly correct. So, so the point is that we have a very good understanding of, this, um, of the partition associated to the lengths of the loops. And I'd like to go back to the question of phase transitions and this nematic uh, ordering. So this can be done using a notion which which was suggested by Tom Spencer, of spin density Laplace transform. The, the name can, was suggested by Jörg Fröhlich. And, um, and, and the idea is to look at the expectation in the Gibbs state. So we are back to the quantum system. Uh, the exponential of, okay, h is just some complex number, divided by the volume, and we sum this operator over the, the whole system. So this is uh, the expectation in the Gibbs state with all symmetries because we, we are not breaking the, the symmetry here. At the same time, if we expect to be in the spin nematic region, we expect that the, the set of Gibbs states uh, 
I mean, is indexed, I mean, the set of external Gibbs states is indexed by the, by the axis, I mean, by this uh, complex, so, uh, sorry, by the projective uh, sphere. So if this is correct, this expectation can be also written as an expectation among extremal states, and we can look at the expectation of this thing. So using translation variance, it, it can be written like that, simplified a little bit, and eventually we get that uh, this thing is equal to, to this function here. So this function involves two parameters. There is h, that's the h over here, and there is an m tilde, and m tilde is given by this exp uh, expression here. So m tilde depends on the system, it depends on beta also, depends on this parameter u. But otherwise, as a function of h, it's just given by this with just one free parameter. So, so here I assume that we have a nematic phase and I did calculations using just the symmetries which I expected using in this nematic phase. Is it correct? So then we can relate it to, to this Poisson de Richelieu conjecture and do the same calculations in the Poisson de Richelieu um, picture. So this is the same expectation as before, but first it can be expressed in terms of the loops. So this is uh, mathematically correct. And then one can assume that the loops are well described using Poisson de Richelieu three half. One can check that the short loops don't, don't matter. So it's only the long loops which matter, which are described by, by this. And some calculations uh, this thing shows that this is given by this um, expression where we have this M star and M star is by definition the, the density of long loops. So we again get uh, a function of h depending on this uh, ad hoc parameter. And the question is whether this new expression is the same as the one before. So before we got this expression here, that's the calculations of the last page. And here we have this one. So as function of h, it still takes a little effort to, to actually relate the two together. But one can check that this is the same provided this m tilde is equal to minus two third m star. So then you get the same function of h. So it's, um, it's quite nice because it shows that, uh, I mean, this confirms the presence of nematic ordering because with the nematic calculations, we got the function of h with, and the Poisson de Richelieu conjecture, which has uh, completely different heuristics, also gives the same function of h. And in addition, we learned that this m tilde which I recall is uh, this expectation here, is equal to minus two third M star. And M star is the density of long loops. So for instance, we know that it's positive. So something which is a bit surprising is that this M tilde is actually a negative quantity. The, the, the M suggests a bit like magnetization because if we were doing this kind of calculations for ferromagnetic systems that would um, that would be the magnetization. So, so that is the fact that uh, this expectation is negative. By the way, this two third, I did not mention it, but this is quite natural to, to subtract two third because if you are like infinite temperature, so the spins are, can be indifferently minus one, zero, one, then the expectation of this thing is two third. So at high temperature, this would be zero. Uh, so, so this is uh, indeed the quantity, I mean, M tilde is zero at high temperature and um, non-zero <laughs> at low temperatures. And the fact that it's negative suggests that at low temperature, it's more likely that this S3 is zero takes value zero. So, so experts in nematic, spin nematic systems have distinguished between the notion of planar nematic when the S3 zero is kind of zero and axial nematic when it takes uh, values plus and minus one. So axial nematic is closer to what we would think in terms of classical spins where this, yeah. Uh, you have one minute. Yeah, thank you. So it will be just enough. So axial nematic is kind of closer to, to classical spin systems where we uh, spins can be, I mean, we, we fix the directions plus or minus and it doesn't matter whether it's plus or minus. Zero is more like a quantum phenomena, but it also break the, this uh, projective sphere uh, symmetry. 
So I wanted to, to show some further numerical evidence from a paper by Föll and Vessel, where Poisson de Richet can also make predictions, but I'm going to skip it. So let me jump to the conclusion. So I hope to, to have convinced you that uh, this spin one system is actually very, very interesting. The phase diagram is, is interesting to, to study. This can be studied using loop representations. And uh, there is this conjecture with a Poisson de Richet distribution, which allows to, to do some calculations with the symmetry breaking. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, we have time for a quick question, a uh, couple of quick questions. First, Oleg, uh, would you like to go ahead? Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, Daniel, could you please remind me what are long loops, what are short loops? Uh, long loops are the loops which are proportional to the volume because, uh, I mean, if you take the, I mean, we look at the loop, the length of the loop, we divide by mm -hmm. V times the volume. And the question is whether this is positive, which, which means that L1 is long or close to zero, in which case it's small. Okay. So long loops here means that the, the total length is proportional to the volume of the system. Okay. okay One last you. question. Nyavant, can you ask your question quickly? Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, actually, somehow I could not get actually like what is this for spin up if I have to see spin pneumatic phase, like you know what kind of interactions actually are needed? The interactions responsible for the pneumatic phase. Yes, but for spin half, not the spin one actually. Ah, I don't think there, there is any pneumatic phase for spin one half systems. I see. Not if in unfrustrated lattices. Uh, sorry? Uh, in kind of, no, some kind of frustrated geometry, like, you know, triangular or some kind of lattice. Actually, it's, it's a good question. I, I don't know. Um, I, I'm sure one, one could imagine some, some complicated lattice where a pneumatic phase would, uh, would occur. But certainly not uh, on ZD with spin one half systems. Mm -hmm. It's unlikely that you get pneumatic phase. I see. Okay, in the interest of time, let's move on uh, to the next speaker. Bedran, can you please share your screen? Okay, all yours. I will give you a heads up after 15 minutes. Bedran? Are you, are you on mute? Vedran, I, I'm afraid you might be on mute. Oh, well, I'm terribly sorry. I, I realized yeah, that. No, I'm... <laughs> oh, we, can, we can hear you. Yeah. My mistake. So thank you, Pinaki, for the kind introduction. Um, thank you, uh, Rolf, Francesca, and Andreas for organizing this nice conference and for the invitation to speak. I'm going to be talking about um, work jointly done with Jörg Grulich, Antti Knowles, and Benjamin Schlank. Um, so we're going to be studying the nonlinear Schrodinger equation on the d-dimensional torus for dimensions 1, 2, and 3. Um, so this is this initial value problem. Uh, we have several parameters. Uh, kappa, it's thought of as a negative chemical potential, so it's a positive quantity in our convention. This is here. Now the interaction potential is a function on lambda, real value, which is of positive type. So, which I recall means that the Fourier transform is pointwise not negative. The initial data is taken to be in the subvolume space, L2 based, with norm given as follows. So S is not assumed to be uh, an integer here, it's a real number. And this uh, has uh, conserved energy, which is the Hamiltonian, an infinite dimensional Hamiltonian structure, given as follows, H of phi. It has a kinetic and interacting term. Right, so with this Hamiltonian structure, one can formally define a Gibbs measure associated with H. Um, it's a probability measure on the space of fields from lambda into C, given by this formula here. Um, so D phi is a formally defined Lebesgue measure on the space of fields. And just by heuristic arguments, formally one can get that the measure is invariant under the flow of the NLS, meaning that if we let FT denote the flow map, the push forward of FT with respect to I mean, the D mu with respect to FT is D mu itself. Right, to make this rigorous um, takes quite a bit of work because these are infinite 
uh, dimensional Hamiltonian systems. So the rigorous construction of these Gibbs measures was a classical problem in constructive quantum field theory in the 1970s. Um, so some relevant results are uh, summarized in the work of Nelson and as well as in textbooks of Glim and Jaffe and Simon. Um, this is just the construction of the measure. The invariance, the proof of the invariance, the second point from the previous slide, was done uh, in the 1990s. There was work of Zhidkov, um, but the real, sort of the true NLS model was finally resolved by Burgen in a series of influential papers in, starting from 1994. Um, the interest in the PDE community to study these measures is that they are supported in low regularity subordinate spaces, and therefore their invariance proves as a substitute for a conservation law at low regularities, so for rough solutions for which one cannot um, use conservation of energy. In general, one can then use this idea to obtain low regularity solutions of the NLS or some other equations, uh, mu almost surely. And there's a long list here, it's not complete, but it's, um, there are a lot, there's a lot of activity in this field in the PDE community. Now, another point of view of studying the NLS is to view it as a classical limit of many body quantum theory. So if we let Hn be the n particle space, so it's the symmetric L2 space on lambda to the n, we can study the n body Hamiltonian on this space, and accordingly we can study the n body Schrodinger equation. This is this linear equation. A general principle says that if we take the initial data, Cn0, uh, to be approximately factorized in some sense, we can just pronounce say, take equality here. Um, then the factorization property remains conserved in time, at least in the large n limit. Uh, and where the factor here is not phi zero, but phi sub t, where phi sub t is the solution of the nonlinear Schrodinger equation starting from initial data phi zero. Uh, this was first uh, observed by HIP in the 1970s, and there have since been many um, results in this direction. Now the problem that we are interested in analyzing is how can we obtain the Gibbs measure mu as a many-body quantum limit? So how can we analyze the Gibbs measure in this type of limiting regime? Now, um, it's instructive to first analyze the classical Gibbs measure when we turn off the interaction. So this is the Wiener measure. So H0 means that we set the interaction to equal zero. This is the Hamiltonian. The Gibbs measure then becomes the Wiener measure. And it's nice to show in, in, one thing we can use, the free assumption, is that we can use Fourier analysis to show typical elements of the support of the Wiener measure have a simple form. They're given as random Fourier series of this type. So the GK are IID complex Gaussians. And so the kth Fourier coefficient is GK divided by this weight here. Here it's important that we're taking this kappa positive so that we're not dividing by zero uh, when K is equal to zero. This object is a random variable. It's the classical free field. And one can then see that the classical free field converges almost surely in the subordinate space H1 minus D over 2 minus epsilon. Um, so in particular, in one dimension, this is a function of regularity 1 H1 half minus epsilon, almost surely. But in higher dimensions, it's a distribution of negative regularity, almost surely. And that causes quite a bit of challenge in the analysis. Um, now, if we have the classical free field, we can put in the, this into the interacting term of the Hamiltonian. This is the classical interaction. And if we're in one dimension, this is um, easy to define because phi omega is an L2 almost surely. So if we take bounded interaction potentials, this is going to be a finite quantity. And furthermore, if we take W to be either a positive type, meaning that its Fourier transform is non-negative or pointwise non-negative, this is going to be a non-negative quantity, um, almost surely. So in this case, we can define the Gibbs measure as a probability measure on the subordinate space, which is absolutely continuous with respect to the Wiener measure. So this construction is simple in 1D, but it breaks down in higher dimensions because this phi omega is not in L2, almost surely. So even if we take bounded interaction potentials, this construction does not work. And this is remedied by a renormalization in the form of wick ordering. 
So I'll not go into the details, but formally what one is doing, one is subtracting off suitably chosen infinities here and renormalizing the interaction. So renormalizing this phi squared term. Um, to make this rigorous, one has to truncate everything in frequency and then let the frequency truncation go to infinity. And this, if W is of positive type, this weak ordered interaction is going to be pointwise non-negative. And so we can define the Gibbs measure in one, two, and three dimensions. Now, um, with, and we can define the expectation uh, of a random variable X with respect to the Gibbs measure. We call that the classical Gibbs state rho. So rho of X is integral of X d mu. And furthermore, we define the classical p-particle correlation functions of this classical Gibbs state. So these are operators on p-particle space whose kernels are given as follows. So we won't maybe for the rest of the talk use the precise form of these operators, but I just want to say that the Gibbs measure, mu, is determined by the sequence of operators gamma p. Um, Okay, now I would like to shift gears and say, what is the setup of the quantum problem? For simplicity, let me consider the one-dimensional case where we don't have to do any renormalization. So we recall we have the n-body Hamiltonian acting on n-particle space. Um, and now we have to just choose the parameters correctly. So we have mass of the particles. Um, that comes as a 1 over m factor here in front of the kinetic term. Recall kappa is positive. And we have a coupling constant lambda, which we put in front of the interaction. So W here is the interaction potential. So we, with this type of uh, n-particle Hamiltonian, um, we can look at its equilibrium. So at inverse temperature beta, which is positive and finite, the equilibrium of Hn is governed by the canonical ensemble. So this is an operator on n-particle space which has trace 1. So it's e to the minus beta hn divided by this normalization factor, which makes this have trace 1. Um, we can henceforth set beta equal to 1. It can be absorbed into the other parameters. So we can always assume that we're working at temperature 1. And we're going to now look at the limiting regime where the mass goes to infinity as 1 over nu, and lambda, this coupling constant, goes to 0. Uh, as order nu squared. And we're going to analyze the regime nu goes to zero. So uh, this can suitably be interpreted as a mean field or semi-classical within which we're going to get the classical Gibbs measure. Right, so in the quantum problem, we're working on the bosonic Fox space. So it's a direct sum of the n particle spaces. And accordingly, we work with a quantum Hamiltonian, which on the n sector acts as this hn Hamiltonian, so Hn nu. This is just from the previous slide with the properly chosen parameters. I will keep just a reminder that W is the interaction here. Um, and on the Fox space, we define the grand canonical ensemble as this um, operator uh, which has trace equal to 1. Okay, so it's, and it's really the canonical ensemble up to some factor on the n sector, but we normalize it so it has trace 1 over all of Fox space. Okay, now uh, just some notation. We're going to work with quantum fields. These are operator value distribution phi nu and phi nu star on the Fox space that satisfy the following commutation relations. So phi nu x and phi nu star of y, they do not commute when the commutator is nu times the delta function of x minus y, and the other uh, combinations do commute. The precise construction of this comes from the creation and annihilation operators, but we'll just assume that these operators exist, or these quantum fields exist. Um, a priori, they have nothing to do with the classical free field, but we have this sort of suggestive notation uh, that phi omega corresponds to the new equals zero limit of phi nu, and phi omega bar corresponds to the new equals zero limit of phi nu star. So. Um, this is sort of justified by seeing that this first commutation relation goes to zero as nu goes to zero. Now, um, we, can, we define the quantum Gibbs state rho nu. So given an operator A on Fox space, we define its expectation uh, with respect to the grand canonical ensemble as follows. And we also define the quantum p-particle correlation functions. 
this is sort of with our previous analogy, we define them like this. Um, and it turns out that these P, uh, this grand canonical ensemble P sub nu is determined by the sequence of gamma nu P. So we were really going to analyze the convergence of gamma nu P to gamma P as nu goes to zero. Right, so... Um, yes? You have five minutes. Oh, okay, thank you very much. I'm... Uh, I'll, I'll now state the result and just give a few comments. So um, in our result, we assume that W is continuous and of positive type. Then we have convergence of the relative partition function, quantum relative partition function to the um, classical relative partition function. And we have the convergence of the p-particle correlation functions in terms of kernels in an optimal LR space. Um, I should say just this result was first uh, taken up by Levin, Nam, and Rougeri, where they resolved really the 1D problem. In the higher dimensional problem, they had some additional assumptions of non-local and non-translation variant interactions. Their methods were quite different, so they were variational. Uh, jointly with uh, Jurganti and Benjamin, we studied the translation variant case in 2 and 3D with a modified Gibbs state by perturbative techniques. Um, subsequently, Levin, Nam, and Rougeri managed to uh, extend their results to translation variant interactions without the modified Gibbs state. Um, I did some work on unbounded interaction potentials, and we studied also the time-dependent problem in 1D, so jointly with Jurganti and Benjamin. Uh, so I would just like to say that this kind of limit can be easily seen in the free case, W equals zero. Um, if we look at the rescaled particle number operator, so this is this operator here, that on the nth sector acts as n times nu times the identity, we can compare it with the L2 norm of phi omega squared, and we see immediately that this is more difficult in higher dimensions, because um, this type of object is infinite, almost surely, in higher dimensions. Now, in the free setting, um, we can compute this expectation explicitly and see that it diverges as nu goes to zero. So finite nu is fine, but sorry, positive nu is fine, but letting nu go to zero, there's a divergence, and there's a need to renormalize. Um, I would just like to mention one word about the proof. So we use a functional integral formulation, unlike our earlier result where we used a perturbative expansion. This is, uh, it was related to what Daniel was talking about, so loop representations. So we're using the interacting Brownian loops and paths representation uh, inspired by Simanzik and Geneva and Simanzin. So this was a very important idea in the 1960s that we have also applied here. And, um, right, so I'll not go into the details of this construction um, for interest of time. We use the hubbard stratonovich transformation and feynman cuts formula. Um, I would just, before concluding, I would just like to say that all of the results that I talked about are uh, summarized, are given in this first result, uh, first paper available in the archive jointly with Jurganti and Benjamin. Um, we also have a survey paper, which summarizes the ideas in sort of an expository way, and will appear in the Journal of Statistical Physics in the um, issue in honor of Professor Joel Leibowitz. All right, thank you very much for your attention. I will stop here. Thank you, Verdun, for keeping to time. Uh, questions? Let's first uh, give the mic to Christian. Christian? Yes, yes, I am, I, I am around. Okay, okay. I, I, I'm not sure my, my question is really pertinent in the framework of your talk, but okay, when, when you, you, you discuss, I mean, interacting um, from the mean field equation, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation, people very often are interested in the so-called, I mean, thermalization and condensation of classical waves. And in, in effect, I mean, the, the numerator that you found somewhere in your slides, one of a K squared plus kappa reminds me of that because the people say that it should converge to the Rayleigh genes distribution, which just assumes this form, okay? So uh, I, I just wonder whether, I mean, you, you, you recover this type of results or you have not studied, I don't know. We have, not, we have not studied this yet, I must say. So sorry, which, which uh, slide were you referring to? Uh, uh, no, again, okay, uh, go up. Uh, this yes, one. yeah, this one. Uh, of, of course, what you would get is uh, uh, kappa would play the role of a chemical potential, okay, but exactly. here you don't have interaction, so I mean, but 
but I, I was wondering whether you, you, you can prove or, or recover that. Because most of the time, I mean, the, the people who do that, it's called, I mean, the wave, uh, the weak, uh, wave turbulence approach, okay? They have a lot of arguments, which are maybe shaky, I don't know, and uh, a lot of numerical evidence. And uh, I, I was wondering whether you can recover that from a mathematical perspective and exact result. Okay. Oh, that's an interesting point. We, we have not we have not studied this. I mean, um, so I guess this, this, in our case, this k squared plus cap. I didn't maybe explain it in, in uh, very precisely before. Um, it comes from when we write. We can since we're in the free case, we can write everything in terms of the Fourier coefficient. Yeah, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. And then this is just saying that the like if we write the Gaussian here, we say that k squared plus cap plus square uh, uh, square root times the k Fourier coefficient has a Gaussian distribution. Mm -hmm. This is where it comes from naturally. So it's very important that we take kappa positive to not have problems with the zero mode. Mm -hmm. um, I see. So you, so you say there is some connection with wave turbo. Okay. Uh, if, if you have some references, I'll be very happy to, to look at this. So we, have, we haven't really looked at this. Yet. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. In the interest of time, let's move on to the, uh, let's thank Vedran once more and uh, move on to the uh, next speaker. Uh, by the way, just like yesterday, we will uh, open up the mics at the end of the session and give a round of applause to everyone together. So next speaker is Nick Hein. Hi. Nick, uh, you're already there. Can you please share your screen? And Nick will be talking about twisted layered heterostructures. I will give you a heads okay. up. 10 minutes, yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, speak to you today. Um, uh, this is gonna be a little bit of a change of pace from the previous two, uh, two talks, uh, which were, I, think, I guess, more on the mathematical side. Mine is more uh, closer to experiment, I suppose. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a reader in the theory group at, the, at work. Uh, and this is work I've done with, in collaboration with quite a large group of, of theorists and experimentalists, uh, including, the Zoo and Cobden groups from the University of Washington and uh, Neil Wilson at work. Uh, and the topic is, is about head making heterostructures out of 2D materials. Uh, so this is possibly of interest to quite a few of you. I've seen it based on the, um, on the talks list. I'm afraid I haven't been here for the last, uh, the, yesterday because I was, um, I'm involved in the, the HETSIS CDT at work and we had our, uh, an, our annual conference yesterday. Uh, but I don't think it's a topic of interest to some of you. Uh, as you probably know, uh, whenever you put 2D materials in contact with each other, you've, you form some sort of heterostructure. Uh, there's a great deal of interest in combining the properties of different 2D materials in order to produce devices that have uh, kind of desirable properties. And this idea has emerged that um, you can kind of make a, make a kind of Lego out of sh uh, different sheets of these materials and they can be put together in, in any form. Now that's definitely oversimplifying things a bit because um, all of these different 2D materials, all the different classes of materials, things like graphene, hexagonal boron nitride, the transition metal dichol cogenides like MOS2 and WSE2, they all have different lattice constants. Many of them have even different structures. Um, and we should expect there to be some um, influence on their behavior from, from, from um, hybridization when we put these, these these states together and that will depend quite crucially not just on what you put together but also on the, the twist angle and that's been found to be the case um, and predicted to be the case before it was even found to be the case with discoveries of, of, of unusual properties like uh, superconducting behavior in twisted bilayer graphene. So I've been looking into this for quite a while. This is, I'm going to start with some, some much older work and then, then catch up with what we've been doing recently. Um, we started by looking at twisted uh, but twisted bilayers of, so tw twisted hetero bilayers of, of different transition metal dichalcogenides. Chalco chal and this is a system where a large lattice mismatch exists and automatically produces an incommensurate interface. You get a moiré pattern uh, and you get, you expect some sort of, um, some sort of twist angle dependence of the, of the band structure from these moiré patterns. Uh, so the, the question is how can we, how can we model these structures from a, densely functional theory, electronic structure point of view. Um, and the approach I take to this is, is to avoid traditional density functional theory. I won't go through what the problem with traditional density functionalizing in any detail, but just to say that there's a, 
automatically a kind of a scalability problem you encounter when you try to make these calculations large. You have a, a number of eigenstates that you have to calculate this proportional to the number of atoms, a number of basis functions, um, which is also proportional to the number of atoms, and an orthogonality requirement, which means that you have to you have a computational effort that scales as the cube of system size. So this kind of approach, traditional density functional theory, becomes unfeasible much beyond around 500, 1,000 atoms or so. Uh, but many many systems need to go a lot bigger uh, in order to enter a realistic regime, and we'll see why in a moment. Um, we have a so, so traditional DFT has an order n scaling of the computational effort. So it's necessary if you want to scale up these calculations to avoid the calculation of eigenstates entirely. And we can actually do that via use of the, the density matrix expressed in an appropriate basis. So the, the single electron density matrix, rho of R R prime, uh, can normally be thought of as written in terms of the, um, the eigenstates. But if we instead express it using local orbitals and then have a, a local general, uh, kind of a, a short range local matrix generalization of the occupation number, then what, we, what this lets us do is exploit the so-called nearsightedness of quantum mechanics and insulators, which is to say that the uh, density matrix decays to zero as a function of R minus R prime, that should be, sorry, uh, as, as that goes to infinity, which means that our matrices can all be made sparse. Um, so we have sparse matrices representing the occupation number, the Hamiltonian, the overlap matrix. And what this means is we can do sparse matrix algebra to do all the normal techniques of electronic structure, like finding the energy, creating the right normalization of the, of the number of electrons, and imposing so-called idempotency on this density matrix, which is just to mean that which, which should, serves to ensure that it, um, it represents a set of, of orthogonal eigenstates. So the code that I'm a developer of is called uh, OneTEP. Uh, we do linear scaling density functional theory. And the things that make this comparatively unique uh, that it runs in a basis of, of local orbitals optimized in situ. So rather than having a large complete basis of local orbitals, we, we have a, a, a very small number of local orbitals, a minimal number, maybe four per, per atom or nine per atom, depending on where you are in the periodic table. And you optimize these orbitals in situ, uh, expressed in terms of a, a basis of so-called p-sync functions, cardinal sign functions. Um, and <clears throat> that means a very efficient optimization scheme, which means that we we get uh, when we when we can as long as we can also do all of our evaluation of the matrix elements in order n, which you can via a so-called FFT box that moves with the atoms. Uh, that means we have order n evaluation of the Hamiltonian, and we have a linear scaling method overall. So we have some sort of crossover uh, to to where linear scaling behavior is is faster. So this, this kind of approach scales even up to, to tens of thousands of atoms uh, and even beyond. So I've shown some sort of plot there of, of time for, for a solution to uh, ever increasingly long strands of DNA there. And that's going from 2,000 atoms to 16,000 atoms within feasible computational time. So this is a code that um, people can get hold of quite easily. We, we sell academic licenses for a very, very small fee uh, or collaborator agreements. Um, and I'm going to describe some application of this to, to 2D materials. Okay, so um, we've we've established, well, it's been established for quite a while now that the, the Van der Waals functionals in DFT are quite capable of describing 2D materials quite well. Um, when we put these two 2D materials together in, in these so-called twisted structures, um, then we need very large supercells, as we saw. Uh, and the kind of supercells that we need for, for systems like this, molybdenum selenide, tungsten selenide, are several, several, several thousand atoms in size. So what we need to do if we want to actually investigate their band structure in a useful way is project that band structure back down to the, to the primitive cell. That effectively means unfolding the, the supercell Brillouin zone to the, to back onto the much larger monolayer Brillouin zone of one, of one layer at a time. Uh, and we developed some code to do this. This is, involves spectral function projection, taking the, the supercell eigenstates, projecting them onto uh, the primitive cell eigenstates uh, with, a, with a layer projector as well. And this lets you do investigation of the, the band structure of one layer in the context of the one layer in its own primitive cell uh, in the context of a supercell calculation. And we can get, we can find some, some quite interesting effects quite easily. Uh, we looked at MOSE2, MOS2 is our first example, 
and we found we could see hybridization when you go from the monolayer here, MRSC2, to the, <clears throat> to the heterobilayer system, uh, then you find a, a repulsion, a hybridization and repulsion and an intrusion of the, the band of the other layer into that, uh, into that system's uh, band structure. Uh, and you get a, a kind of hybridization and repulsion and this can affect many of the, the band structure properties. We can, find, we can vary the effective mass of the, of the states and we can vary the, uh, the transition depending on the, so vary the, um, the, the nature of the transition from direct to indirect. Uh, it's about a function of twist angle and, and composition. And we can get some interesting behavior like layered, like, like twist angle dependent, um, twist angle dependent effective masses. Uh, so this got us involved in collaborations with, with experimental groups at Warwick. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of their, their experimental tour de force that re was required to produce these structures, but they've been able to make very controllable flakes of flakes of, of monolayer TDM TMDC, where they've been able to put together different combinations uh, on top of each other in a very controllable way. And we've been able to help explain these calculations. So. We, we, we first got involved by explaining how they're, they're just, just, just being able to predict their RPES results. So their RPES results shown in these intensity maps here uh, align very well with our, our DFT calculations for monolayer, bilayer, and bulk. So they, they give us some, some confidence in the, in the methodology. And then we were able to apply this to um, heterobilayers of re real systems and explain the, the hybridizations that we see going from um, regions of just WS2, regions of WSE2, um, and then to, to hybrid, to regions where the flakes cross each other and overlap. And our DFT calculations explain those very well and get in, and reproduce the, the, correct, um, the correct, correct splitting of those two hybridized, hybridized bands. So we've got convincing quantitative agreement to the hybridization there. Uh, obviously, the RPES quality, the, the, the resolution of the RPES is rather lower than our than our DFT data, but I think you can see that it's following the same uh, the same behaviour. And so we were able to use this then to explain some quite novel behaviour. We saw um, when when one made when one tried to make aligned structures, so nearly zero degree structures in uh, mater heterous bilayer materials, which had um, the same, basically the same lattice constants, so like, so like WSE2 and MOSE2, then if you try to align those, if you, if you intentionally misalign them, you get behavior that uh, is quite easy to explain. You get hybridization like in the previous figure. But if you intentionally align them, then you get a rather unusual signal in the RPES. You get three bands rather than the two you might expect from the hybridization. And we were able to do some DFT calculations that explain this. We found that when we superimpose the the individual monolayer um, results with the heterostructure results, uh, what we got was a, a quite convincing ex explanation of the of the overall results. That in, it, what seems to be the case is that in the that there are a coexistence of commensurate regions, which, which where the alignment of the layers is much closer, where, sorry, where the interlayer distance is much smaller, and they produce a strong hybridization. And then you have incommensurate regions where the where the interlayer distance is much larger and there's a much weaker hybridization. And the bands are basically the same as they're um, the the so it's the same as they are in the in the non-aligned case. So when we when we superimpose the the band structures of the three different systems there, the, the monolayer MOSE2, the, the monolayer WSE2, and then the um, the aligned system, then we get a fairly convincing explanation for that overall result. And this is, allows us to get a lot more information out of the RPES results than we otherwise would. Um, I'm going to skip the bit on, so we've, they also, that, this is also work where we established uh, some of the first observations of um, interlayer excitons where we have the, the hole in one layer and the, the <clears throat> electron in another uh, and it produces an exciton overall of a considerably lower uh, energy than, than would otherwise be absorbed in either of the individual seen in either of the individual layers, uh, and then we moved on to uh, looking at gating these hetero structures. So we <clears throat> we were at the, they were able to build structures where they could put controllable gate voltages onto these structures and shift the Fermi level within our within our hetero structures, and they were able to show that gated monolayer um, graphene behaved as as theory would predict. 
And then we, we looked at applying these same techniques to uh, tungsten diselenide and looking at using the, 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 the gating to bring to drag the, the Fermi level up into the conduction band so that we could actually see the conduction band. But in order to be sure what they were seeing and whether or not they were seeing um, the, the conduction band at different parts of the Brillouin zone, so there's, 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 there's val conduction band valleys at both, at both Q and K, and they're, they're quite close in energy. Uh, we wanted to be sure that we were getting good agreement with the um, with the RPES in this result. Really, kind of, then they had higher resolution RPES than they did before in this in this in this work. Uh, so we switched to doing uh, GW calculations on these on these systems, and we looked at GW calculations on monolayer, bilayer, and uh, trilayer WSE2, and we got we managed to to work out how to converge those calculations very well in order to get very convincing agreement. Of so that we could be very confident what regions we were actually looking at in the in the RPES. Yeah. Yep. You have four minutes. Okay. Yep. Nearly there. Uh, so <coughs> we, um, yeah. So we so they, they then they've been able to observe the um, the conduction band filling filling up as we move the Fermi level push the Fermi level up into the into the valence band, and they've also been able to make a lot of conclusions about. Um, about uh, band gap renormalization in those systems as we as we uh, as we start to populate the conduction band. Okay, so I'll just move on to the current work. Um, our current interest is in post-transition metal to alkogenides. That's formula MX, where we have indium, gallium, or aluminium, and sulfur and selenium usually, and they exhibit a direct to indirect transition with increasing with sorry, reducing layer number, and they have this interesting Mexican hat potential where we have a kind of dip at gamma. Uh, we've been able to simulate this, in the, so the, the, the first observation they, they made when they, they looked at this in ARPES were these strange um, kind of flicks in the, in the band structure within the INSE band structure. And we were able to explain this in terms of the, the fact that they'd encapsulated their, their, um, their systems in graphene. And you might think that graphene would have no impact on the, the uh, INSE band structure, but actually you get this really interesting effect of um, so-called umclap hybridization. That's to say the, the graphene has a much short, smaller lattice constant than the INSE, and therefore when you project the, uh, the graphene bands back into the INSE Brillouin zone um, in, in, into the regions outside of the, um, so in, into the, but when you reflect the, the graphene band structure in the, in the effectively in the uh, Brillouin zone boundaries, you can get hybridizations that occur well away, outside of the first Brillouin zone of INSE, but are mirrored back into the first Brillouin zone. So you get the situation where uh, band crossings that happen well away from the, the, the well, well outside the, the first Brillouin zone for INSE cause hybridization effects inside. So we get these kind of ghost anti-crossings. And we think this is a quite powerful um, technique because it can, uh, you can effectively have non-local modification of band structures this way. And you can get these very interesting twist effects, which I haven't got time to, to go into, but there's a, uh, we've got an, an animation of there that, 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 that I can't unfortunately play in a PDF. Maybe I can, no, I can't really share that, can I? Okay, so <clears throat> that's a manuscript that's under review at the moment. Uh, and we were able to model that by, um, by just using a simple two band model that uh, we can measure the hybridization and the, 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 the coupling parameter from that model. Okay, I'll skip that next bit. Uh, so our, our, our overall our, our methods, linear scaling DFT with one tep allow us to do DFT calculations on really large systems like this, layered material heterostructures comprising thousands of atoms. We're able to extract the, the, the band structure effects back to project them back into the, the, two, the, the Brillouin zone of each individual material. And with these techniques, uh, we've been able to explain the, the coexistence of commensurate and incommensurate domains. We've been able to, I haven't shown those two middle bits, but uh, that's, in, that's I to cut those bits out. Uh, but we've also been able to explain this umclap scattering, scattering that can cause uh, ghost hybridizations and non-local modification of the band structure. Okay, so I'd like to thank the various people I've worked with. Uh, my group, that was uh, Temok Salazar, Charmaine Lowe, Cameron Fantham, and Nikita Chana. And the experiments were done by Neil Wilson's group and Dave Cobden and Jia Dongju. Okay, thank you very much. 
Thank you, Nick. Uh, I think we have time for one quick question. Okay, if there is none, I, I have a question. I think uh, uh, often when you have this flat bands, the uh, effects of interaction becomes very strong. Mm. How do you deal, that, uh, deal with that in, in uh, DFT? Well, there are, there are various ways you can go beyond yeah, beyond DFT, we haven't done any of that in, in this in this model. We've we've just been staying in the in the the Ken Chan picture. So, okay. And if not, if you allow me, I would uh, I like to ask very quickly. So, if you have smaller unit cells, the there are more conventional DFT investigations. How does one tap compare with these uh, on the smaller unit cells? Well, one tap is is slower for primitive cells than a traditional DFT code simply because um, we're using a, a non-orthogonal basis and therefore you have a um, you have even just evaluation of density costs you a, a quadratically scaling amount per per band uh, so so until you get to a I mean there's a scaling crossover figure there until you get to about a thousand that, that that's probably and that's for a 3d system for a 2d system it'd be more they'd be a crossover more like um four or five hundred atoms where the, the linear scaling methods took over as as favorable the results are consistent if you're smaller oh yeah yeah absolutely you can get exact reproduction of the plane wave results yeah yeah okay thank you okay thanks for having me here today um, Xiong and from NTU and very glad to talk about my recent work on multi-stable axitonic stark effects. This work is done uh, under the supervision of my PhD supervisor, Professor Justin Song from NTU and we are in collaboration with Prof. Mark Rudner from uh, New Sport Institute in Copenhagen. So let me just give you a brief overview of, of the project. We are interested in uh, how light matter interaction can be used to modify the, uh, the material properties. So one example of, of, of this is the extonic optical stark effect. When we have an extonic system and we shine light, say we shine off resonant radiation to couple the excitons, and if the light frequency is below the excitonic transition frequency, then we'll have a blue shift of the exciton transition uh, frequency to, to, to higher energies. And this, is, this, this effect is called the optical stark effect. And uh, the main result of, of our, our, our work is that if these excitons are coupled to a nanophotonic cavity system instead of just a radiation, then uh, the mutual tuning between uh, excitons and photons due to this light matter interaction can give rise to strong nonlinearity and multi-stable steady states in the coupled system. And this leads to hysteresis. And we believe that this could be a potential mechanism to the, for the applications of optoelectronic devices. So in this talk, I will first give a brief introduction on optical star effects followed by the mechanism behind this multi-stable stark effect. And uh, I will end my talk by uh, give a brief introduction on how this can be realized in transition metal dichrochrogenite. So uh, first, I believe that uh, we, we are all very familiar with excitons, which is just a bounded state of electron hole pair. And a single exciton can be described by a two-level system Okay, with uh, energy separation E0, where A denotes the electronic ground state and B denotes the uh, excitonic state. Now, if, if this, uh, this two-level system is coupled to a light field, at the classical or uh, photon field, then we, we may have this photon just states uh, given by the red, red, red uh, segment. And due to light matter interaction, uh, this, uh, say, for example, the light, the electric field in the light can be coupled to the exciton dipole moment. And level repulsion will give rise to a larger, uh, larger excitonic transition energy. And this blue shift of the excitonic transition energy is 
directly proportional to the electrical squared, which is uh, proportional to the light intensity. Now, this, is, this is what happens when the exciton is coupled to uh, a irradiation field. And it has been uh, readily, uh, it has been well known and observed in pump, pump, pump probe experiments in excitons. But this could be more interesting if we consider an uh, exciton to be coupled to a, a cavity mode. And, 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 and this light matter impression will not only just modify the exciton transition, but it will also modify the photon frequencies. So how, how can we see this? Um, we first consider a very simple model when we have a single localized exciton uh, coupled with a cavity mode. So the single localized exciton is described by a two-level system with X. The S equals to zero is the ground state with no exciton, and S equals to one is the excited state with one single exciton. And, and, and the exciton transition is given by mu naught, and the, uh, the photon frequency is given by omega naught. And interaction between the exciton and the photon is, can, can be described by this dispersive coupling Hamiltonian, which is directly proportional to, uh, a, uh, to, to the photon number A dagger A, as well as the exciton population S. So uh, before I jump into the details of, of, of the math, let me just give you um, a physical intuition how this interaction Hamiltonian gives rise to mutual tuning between cavity and exciton mode. So if we just say, for example, if we take a mean field approximation on the on the cavity mode uh, on, the ca on the on the photons field, and we, by replacing a dagger a with the photon number, then this Hamiltonian this interaction Hamiltonian is just an additional contribution to the uh, to the exciton transition frequency. And this blue shift of exciton is proportional to n. Alternatively, we can also take a uh, mean field approximation over the exciton field by replacing the uh, by replacing the s operator uh, with the with the exciton population. So it's either zero or one in the one exciton case. And this 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 h int then can be viewed as an additional contribution to the photon transition, to the photon, uh, to the photon Hamiltonian. And this gives rise to a blue shift of the photon, of the photon transition frequency. Uh, and this, this blue shift is directly proportional to uh, S, the exciton population. So in this way, we have a mutual tuning effects, whereby exciton transition depends on photon population and photon transition depends on the exciton population. Now, uh, this, this mutual tuning gives strong nonlinearity when we drive the system. Say, if, if, we now, if I now drive the system, I drive exciton mode with a field Fx, but I drive the photon mode with a separate field F0. And now let's consider, um, let's pretend that we are, we are doing this experiment, and we were doing this experiment by fixing some Fx, the exciton driving field but we gradually increase the photon drive F0. Now, if F0 increases, uh, we expect the photon population to increase. But we, we re recall that the, the exciton transition frequency depends on the photon, uh, photon number. So if M increases gradually, and say if the exciton drive is slightly blue detuned from the bare exciton uh, frequency, then we're, by increasing M, we're able to gradually shift the frequency of, of the exciton transition towards its driving, uh, driving frequency. This will in turn increase the uh, exciton population. But on the other hand, we know that the, uh, the photon frequency also depends on the exciton, exciton population uh, by this uh, V times S. So if we increase S, we'll be able to gradually blue shift the blue shift the uh, photon photon frequency, and if the photon driving field is also blue detuned from its uh, its uh, photon mode, then this will in turn increase the photon population. 
So in the end, we have this uh, feedback mechanism. And this neutral tuning, this feedback can give rise to uh, the multi-stability, which I will explain later. So to, to, to vigorously prove this multi-stability, we, we examine the master equation of a driven dissipative coupled system. We consider some uh, exciton recombination rate, gamma, and some uh, cavity decay, kappa. And by after going through some algebra, we are able to derive the steady state solutions for, for exciton population S and photon population M. And uh, we can already observe from this that S depends on uh, its uh, exciton transition frequency, which in turn depends on M. And M depends on uh, photon frequency omega, which depends on S. And when we solve this coupled uh, equations self-consistently, we actually find out a fifth order polynomial in terms of S and M. So this gives rise to bi-stability and tri-stability, whereby for each uh, cavity drive intensity, we actually have multiple branches, multiple dis distinct branches of um, stable and unstable steady state solutions. Uh, here, stable by, by stable, I mean that if we per per perturb the system a little bit from the steady state, then after some time, the system will evolve back to its steady state, to the, to the original steady state solution. By unstable, I mean that if I perturb the system a little bit, it will, the system will, will not go back after some time. It will just evolve to another stable steady state. So uh, in these graphs, we can see that we are able to, these graphs are plotted uh, using parameters of uh, uh, TMD, a single layer TMD tungsten disulfide. And we, can, we observe that we are able to achieve this hysteresis patterns, uh, even at uh, quite moderate uh, driving amplitude, which is uh, tens, or at least below 100 kilowatts per, se uh, per centimeter square. Okay. And uh, furthermore, we are able to tune the magnitude, uh, we're able to tune the magnitude between the discontinuous jump of the star ship in x tones it turns out that, that the discontinuous jump in, in Starship, in exciton in Starship, is quite prominent with this uh, moderate drives. It is in the order of one millieV in, in tungsten deselenite. Uh, we are also able to uh, tune the system parameters like the detunings and the line widths to, to transit from the bi-stability state, uh, bi-stability phase to try to be phase. And, and so, so in this case, this uh, is a highly tunable um, multi-stable state, multi-stable phase. Now, so far we have only been considering a single exciton coupled to a cavity mode. However, we know that uh, in, in, in real matters, in, in real, real material, we can have a large degen degeneracy of, of excitons in a single, within a single photon, uh, photon wavelength. So take an example of TMD placed on top of photon crystal. Uh, the, exit, uh, the photon wavelength is uh, typically a few hundred nanometers, where the ball radius of the, of the excitons in TMD are quite small, is in the order of uh, one nanometer. That means we, within one photon wavelength, we can have many, many excitons uh, the degeneracy number is about uh, 100 to 10,000. These, since these excitons are in, within one uh, photon wavelength, they, they will actually uh, interact coherently with, with these single photons. As, as they can form, these localized excitons can form um, uh, uh, superpositions, plan wave superpositions to sure. give rise to delocalized excitons. So instead of considering a single exciton S, now we have to consider S total, which by summing up all the excitons within one photon wavelength. And that, this okay. means that- At uh, three minutes. Oh, okay, thank you. This means that if, if uh, 
This means that the photon frequency uh, blue shift is keep, now given by V times S total instead of V times S. Uh, this means that we have a very, we can have a very large shift in photon frequency due to the interaction with excitons. Uh, furthermore, if we calculate the, but mind you, even though we replace S with S total, the basic physics is the same. So the basic basic mechanism between this for the for the detuning between exciton and photon modes is still the same. So so we still get uh, we will still get multi-stability and anti-stereosis patterns. Uh, the main difference is that now S total uh, the exciton population is directly proportional to S the de degeneracy number. So we have this extra factor S in front of the uh, driving intensity of for the for the excitons. That means we are able to achieve, uh, given other parameters of the system the same, we are able to achieve multi-stability in in ex in these coupled systems with a much smaller uh, driving field for exciton. Um, we predict that we are able to achieve multi-stability with with a uh, with a quite uh, moderate uh, driving field which can be below kilowatts per centimeter square. So I, I think this is, this is quite prominent. Uh, this is uh, smaller than other mechanisms for, for optical bias stability like external external interaction, where you need high driving field to, to have a very high uh, external density in order to give, in order to have any significant nonlinear effect. So with this, I thank you for your attention. And this is my, the end of my talk. Thanks. Thank you, Xiaoming. There is time for some quick questions. Uh, Andreas, you want to go first? Okay. Well, I think Christian uh, should have been first, but for the sake for the sake of um, speed, let me go first. Um, so I was wondering about uh, dissipation. So if you have a lower sick cavity, it wasn't quite clear to me whether you have included it. Um, whether that is then the balance of driving and losses or if inclusion of, um, well, I mean, dissipation could uh, impact the long-term behavior. So what are your comments on that? Uh, sorry, uh, do you mean that uh, the, the time scale between the... Well, the thing is if you have a lossy cavity, uh, mm -hmm. if you include this, would it change the long-term behavior if you, if you included it? Uh, we did we did include the uh, okay um, here the the cavity decay uh, time scale is uh, is a uh, less than nanosecond so uh, I think that uh, it is is less than one nanosecond it's a it's a tens tens of picosecond so I believe that uh, we can. I missed you included it. Thank you. It's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, okay. Christian. Uh, yes, I had, I mean, uh, because, okay, when, when you see the hysteresis curve, okay, when, the, when you just jump to the higher curve, okay, mm -hmm. uh, can you witness, I mean, in your analysis, uh, time analysis, the, the phenomenon of critical slowing down? Uh, what, what, what's slowing down? Uh, critical slowing down means, I mean, in fact, when, when it's, it's um, the, the physics you described, there is also dynamics as, associated to it, right? Yeah, yes. Okay. So it's just like, uh, I would say, uh, just like in a phase transition, okay? So in principle, you should be uh, uh, sensing the point uh, where the transition will happen before it happens, okay? With, with some uh, time uh, signature, which is called the, the, the critical slowing down. Yes, oh. when you arrive at the point where you we, start, uh, we you, you, you jump. Yes. Point. So did, yes. did you do a time analysis or something like that or not? Um, uh, no, sorry, no, not. Uh, we, uh, didn't we, didn't, we didn't do this time analysis. Okay. Uh, but okay. From previous experiments of this, this kind of uh, stark effect, it typically occurs in the time scale of picosecond. Uh, but I didn't. Yeah. I, okay. Yeah, this, yeah. Okay. Let's move on to the next speaker. Thank you, Xiangying. Okay, thank you. Next speaker is Suo Wen Shu, continuing with the theme of excitons and polaritons.
Lauren, can you share yes. your screen? Yes, sure. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Okay, Professor, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon and good morning to everyone. My name is Hua Wen and I'm from NTU Singapore. Uh, as a very beginning, I want to thank the organizer for allowing me to present my recent work in here. And today I will talk this universal self-correcting computing with uh, disordered exciton polarity neural networks. So this is the outline of my presentation. Uh, first, I will talk this artificial neural networks, like what is a point and how we use it and the main types of it. Then the, I will introduce this physical system, this exciton polarity network. Then based on the previous, the, the earlier uh, physical platform and the algorithm, we perform this universal self-correcting computing. So, so first, what is the artificial neural net network? In technique, it is a bio-inspired eff effective information processing platform. So, so we have some artificial neurons and this would correspond to the neurons in our human brain. Also, to form a network, we need the connections, or we call it connection ways. And this, this part would con, uh, correspond to the synapses in the biological brain. So, what is the point of this uh, architecture? If we compare this to the most standard computers we are using right now, uh, they are blocked by this one new man bottleneck which means the CPU or the processor is separated from the memory. So for every processing, for every computing, we need to get over this gap. This takes a small time, but it's still, we, we, we can't eliminate it. So, but for this artificial neural network architecture, we don't have this problem because the processor and the memory, they happen at the same place. And this is the most point of this artificial neural network. So uh, there are usually two main types of these networks, uh, feed forward and recurrent. Uh, later on, we will focus on uh, a special case in the recurrent neural network, which is this reservoir computing. So let's take a brief look at this feed forward one. So as the name suggests, the activation or the information in this network only goes in the forward direction. Uh, there are usually like input, hidden and output layers. And here IHO indicates the neurons in these three layers. Uh, this input and output is easy to understand, but why the, the middle one is hidden? Because there's uh, no readout on this layer, and which means there's no direct interaction between this layer and outside. Also, this W1 to W8 would be the connections. Uh, it is used to pass the activation to the nodes in the next layer. It's uh, usually some just some real numbers. And to make it simple to understand, we, we, we uh, see how this information goes. Like for the activation received by H1, it should be, let's use a pointer. It should be from this pass and this pass, and we sum it. So it equals I1, W1 plus I2, W2. And there is usually an activation function of each node, this F. It's usually a nonlinear function. It determines whether the activation is strong enough to activate the node. And then the output of this H1, this node would be FH1. So the, the, the same for O1. So the activation received by O1 would from H1 and H2. So then the activation received by O1 is in, in this form. Then we still apply the activation function. So read out from the output layer, the first node would be F01. And usually in the, in, in the working of the network, we first offer a set of known example. And we tell the network what it should be. And based on this known example, we optim optimize all these connections. And this process is called learning or training. It's, it's like us, we, we, we learn based on what we know. And the other type would be the recurrent neural network. So recurrent network, why they are recurrent? So because there are some feed, feedback loops uh, as here shows. So we can see the output from one node can be taken as the input of itself or the nodes in the previous layer. 
and this property makes this uh, recurrent neural network possess temporal dynamical behavior. And this is very interesting because in our life, we are facing many time dependent questions like speech recognition or nonlinear time series prediction. But uh, now the problem is in reality, we are facing many complicated questions and that requires a lot of nodes and a lot of layers. Then training or learning becomes a big trouble because what we can deal is we deal with it, but it's time consuming. Then people come up with this uh, concept called reservoir computing. The core of the system is this reservoir, and all, but the important point is all these nodes inside the reservoir is random. They are randomly connected. Uh, we don't care how many nodes they are connected. Uh, we don't care about the strength, and, but we know they are connected. So this saves us a lot of time in training the connection between each nodes. From here, all the inputs are weighted also randomly and we feed them into the reservoir. Then after some time, we collect the information from each node, like the, the obtained output is like this small y. It can be anything like the phase, the amplitude or the intensity. And we, what we want is this desired output, capital Y. This can be anything we want. Like we want it to be a, a, a number or a matrix. It, it be, depends on the problem we are solving. And the only process we need to control is this desired output and this obtained output, which is uh, uh, in this relation, y equals w out times y. And this w out would be the output weight. So then only this part needs to be controlled. This saves a lot of us a lot of time in training and learning or learning. So, and solving this becomes a linear problem and it's very easy for us. And this concept has been applying in many physical systems uh, like superconducting chips to optical electronics or optical systems or memory store arrays. Then what we are talking about is this exciton polarical network. So, in technique, exciton polaritons, they are quasi-particles, bosonic part quasi-particles resulting from light matter coupling in microcavities. To give a rise to this particle, first we, we, we have a quantum well, it's called a well because it traps the electron. So the electron cannot escape to the surrounding. If now we inject a, a light wave or laser, this, this electron will absorb the energy of the light and leave its original place and leave a hole there. Compared to the, the surroundings, the hole is positively charged. Then this particle forms this exciton. But exciton is not very stable. After some time, electron will fall back to the hole and release energy in the form of the light. If now we, we add a cavity to trap the light, and this process will happen again and again. So in the middle part, it behaves like a particle, which we call it an exciton polariton, or briefly polariton. The interesting part for polariton is it has the properties from both its root parts. Like from exciton, we know it has strong nonlinear energy and electric and magnetic sensitivity because it's, it's, it's a dipole. And from photon, it, we, we know it has low effective mass and long diffusion time. Then this polariton, possess the properties from both parts. So firstly, it has low effective mass. And this is very important because like, like many research are, are, are proceeding based on this like both instant condensation. And also it has the capacity to interact with each other. And the magnitude is much more strong than other photonic systems. And this for photons, they can't. Also uh, thanks to the, the, the photonic part, it has ultra fast response in picosecond time scale. And this is very well, if, if very good if we want to make a device. And earlier, this polarital network in real space, uh, in a lattice, has been demonstrated in theory and experiment that it can be used as a machine learning platform. So what we can see here is you, it, it's using this work, this work is using the, the very classical task for machine learning, the pattern recognition. So for, for, for the MINIST database, which is a set of handwritten digits, we they, they first uh, pixelize uh, the figure and randomly weight them, put them into the lattice reservoir. 
And this latest reservoir uh, here, they are using nearly neighbor coupling. And this is a polar tone lattice reservoir. After some time, the activation of each node would be collected and they perform the, the classification. And in this work, 95% success rate has been achieved, which is uh, very good, and both in theoretically and experimentally. So what we are doing is we, we try to use the polar tone modes in reciprocal space. And later on, we will talk why we use in reciprocal space. So first, we can see this is our physical system. We have our uh, input laser field uh, shining on the macro cavity, disordered macro cavity. And this would be the polar tone modes in reciprocal space. We are utilizing the polar tone modes with the same energy. So from here, we can see this is the implant dispersion. If we pump in the uh, same energy, uh, uh, all the polar tone modes would be in the circle, in, in, in a circle. So here is uh, the uh, gauss pedowski equation describing the dynamics of the system. One, we have the you have three minutes. Oh uh, yes, sure. Uh, so uh, this would be the resonant pumping term, and this would be the nonlinear interaction term. So this term allows all the polar tone modes to interact with each other. And why here we are using this uh, resonant pumping? Because if we solve this equation analytically, we can see the out output field has the same frequency as the input. So this is very nice if we want to cascade the signals. So now what we want to do is this universal self-correcting computing. So we, we first uh, introduce this topic gate. Is this topic gate is uh, first reversible and universal. Universal means uh, with only topic gate, we are able to construct any logic gates or logic circuits. So now we, we, we can see this is all the input would be binary, the output would be binary. So, so we allocate all the input information, this U here to uh, modes in reciprocal space, and this would be the input, and this would be the output. But in, in, the, in, in, in the work, it might be not perfect binary, but it, it, it's fine. We, we define a logic level, uh, which means below 0.5, we, we name it zero, and above 0.5, we, we call it one. So this would be the main result. So we can say if we increase the, the system size and collect all the output information and compare uh, what, what is the error with uh, the correct output. And we can see, because we are dealing with binary, so three nodes is good enough to keep the error below 0.5. And if we increase it to eight, it will be very, very good. So the error is zero. And we say also, because we ship the uh, uh, input signals with these random weights, so it, it somehow shapes the uh, uh, input power. And we also investigate how the input power influences the, the result. So we can say this, this part would be the system size and this would be the, the input power. So we can say if we increase the input power and increase the system size, from here, we, we, we define the logic level 0.5 three nodes is good enough. And if we have smaller input power, maybe we need five or six. Also, uh, we, we add some noise manually to the input signals to see if it can deal with noise data because that's, that's what the network good at. So we, the, the noise it add in this A plus B I format. And we see this is the input noise. So uh, if we add the input noise is randomly distributed in from minus 0.1 to 0.1, both imaginary and real part. And we collect all the output noise uh, from here. And we can see if we include the nodes from 10 to 80, the, the noise are very well corrected and the, the error here are centered uh, around zero. So this means uh, we correct the error and we have the same frequency. So we can cascade all the top of the gates and perform universal uh, computing. We also want to try if this can do more complicated missions like uh, composite circuits. We take four letter as an example, and we now we are not cascading all of them. We try to realize it them in one step, and we see similar results. So we define the logic level in point five, and we can see like we use uh, five or six nodes is good enough to keep the, the output error below point five. Also similar noise, uh, correction result is shown in, in, in this four letter circuits. So this, this is quite powerful if we want to make very 
healed circuits. And that's the uh, conclusion of my part. And uh, I thank you, thank my, my supervisor, Prof. Tim, and my, my, my senior, Dr. Sanjeev, and our collaborator, Professor Mikhail Matuzuski. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Any questions? Okay, since we are running late, running behind time, uh, let's move on to the next speaker. Thank you, Huawen. And okay. GLU, the next speaker, GLU, joins us from Xiangtan in China. Yeah. Yeah. GLU, can you share your screen? Yeah, I will share my screen. Okay, great. So can you, you have 15 me? minutes, and I will give you a um, ringer after 12 minutes. Okay. Hello. Hello, everyone. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak here. Okay, now I'll present my work, localization phase and the transition in the three-dimensional extended liberal lattices. First, let us talk about the background. As we all know, Anderson opened up a new field of physics and attracted a lot of attention on disorder systems. So we are using your screen. Yeah. Yeah. Can, you, can, you, can you hear me? We can hear you. We cannot see your uh, slides. Can, you can see your slide? No. Can you see now? Nope. Can you see now? Yeah, right. Now it's fine. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. Oh. Okay, uh, since we present a paper absence of diffusion in certain retinitis in 1958. And uh, another concern, another area of concern is the flat, flat energy band. Flat energy bands means there, are no, there, is no, uh, there is no dispersion in whole case space, which will result in localization without disorder. Mm, the system, the system that exhibit flat bands, correspond usually to engineered lattices, such as Quincy, Quincy one did lattices and uh, diamond type lattices, and uh, the leaf lattices. But uh, less attention has been has been given to three D three D flat band systems or ex extended leaf lattices. So we will uh, we invest we in investigate the localization properties of three D lip lattices and is is extension and the disorder. Let me make a brief introduction to the Anderson Anderson model and the three D lip mod sorry lip models and its and its extension. Mm. And this model is a cubic lattice with a uniform potential, uniform, uniform potential disorder um, strength. 3D lip lattices can generate it from a uniform, from a uniform, uh, from a cubic lattice by adding, adding items in uh, along the edge. Mm, if we add one items in the in the cubic lattice, we call it R three one, R three one lip lattice. If we add two, we call it R three two. Like like that, we call it uh, if we we call it R we call it R three n. If we put uh, n n items in the in the edge. Mm. By the way, we consider we consider we consider our model as a bar with cross equal to 
n square, like this, n is one, n, like here is equal to one. Uh, in our work, our user, we use the transform matrix. Oh, sorry, what happened? In our work, um, we use transform matrix to calculate it. Oh, I don't know why. Transform matrix to calculate the YAPU exponent and the localization length is determined by the inverse of minimal MIAPO exponent. To obtain the critical critical properties of the system, we should we need to apply the finite oh, sorry. I don't know. We need to apply the finite side scaling. Uh, what the heck? Finite side scaling method capital lambda capital lambda is defined as the uh, reduced reduced localization length um, which we can we can expand according to relevant relevant and irrelevant scaling variables by making by making telex ex expansion we can get the get the full Get four expansion order N I N R M I M R M I, which we will show in the later. Here we will show the results. First, uh, we calculated the dispersion relation relations for L three one to L three four, uh, which we with the tight bending method where we only we only count the nearest neighbors. We can see R three N has N R three N has N double has N double flat band N double degenerate flat bands uh, which this which the the over the overall bands with the, the overall bands decrease as a, as n increase. We can see from uh, from the R three one it width is uh, nearly three point five, and uh, to R three four it nearly to zero point eight. And uh, next. Uh, the you can see the number of flat bands in the in the n equal, in the n go to infinitely we can speculate that the dispersion relationship is similar with solely one d system because the uh, we can see the dispersion the width of the dispersion relation relation is go to uh, go to shrink, uh, sh shrink, shrink, in, shrink, shrink, and shrink, and then they they will go to like uh, flat bands like here. So we, okay, that's all. And next, we will consider the consider the density of states in the graph of density. We use the Direct diagonal method of to calculate the density of state for R three one to R three two. They are both they are both from disorder equal to zero to five point zero instead of zero point zero five with three samples for R three one, R three two, and R three three. They are both, uh, but uh, uh, we, they are with. Uh, 300 samples, 300 samples, but uh, for our 34 is 100 samples. Besides, uh, we have applied with Gauss burden to make doors smoother. We can we can see for for weak disorder the clear clearly large large peaks 
can be seen in here, but uh, when the disorder uh, bigger bigger than three, the dose have been uh, the dose have been merged. The peak of the dose have merged into one broad dose, like, like this. Next, uh, we are show the we are show the face diagram. Face diagram. Uh, the three lines, the three lines represent the upper, approximate location of the face face boundary. Um, blue line is constructed by m by width m equal to six and eight. The red line is by six and six and ten. The green line is eight and ten. Um, error bus is less equal to zero point one percent. Inside the boundary, the contains extended states where outside are lo localized states. Uh, the the back the back the back rhombus represent the analytical results show analytical analytical band edge is a disorder equal to zero. The two shaded in the corner um, represent the forbidden forbidden errors like here. The solid square the solid square represented the high precision FS result at the E and E equal to energy E equal to zero. We represent the the represent the finite size result. You can see the critical disorder equal to oh, oh point, eight point six. Um, at the energy equal to one, we also show the also show the show the FS result. You can see like the like on the right. Yeliu, you have mm -hmm. three more minutes. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, the face diagram are uh, on the W equal disorder W equal to six and the three. I show we also we also show the FS result. You can see like this. And there there is for R three two the symbols lines and the colors are the same as R three one, but uh, with the arrows is less than zero point two percent. We can see we doing we also doing the FS result at the energy equal to zero and the energy equal a disorder equal to four. You can show like this. You can see that the critical disorder is equal to zero point nine, and the, this is for R three three. They are all the same, like R three two. We just do the FS result at the energy equal to zero. You can see the critical disorder is equal to four point six nine, and we show the um. We show the table summary all FS results for different NR and I, NI and, and MI, like this. The, and we average all the results like, like this, like here. We can get a conclusion that uh, the critical disorder, oh, sorry, what happened? Is here. Mm. You can see the accuracy of the data is not good enough to reliably fit the fit the irrelevant uh, irrelevant scaling contribution. So uh, the results are all for NI and MI equal to zero. We can we can see the all all of our critical exponents in this graph. Uh, we have compared our results with the record Rodriguez and the Slavens results. Like like this, you can see they are um, they are 
uh, they are in general agreement with the previous results. Um, that's that's my that's my conclusion. Okay. So first uh, we have uh, we have you have I I said before and the the second I also. I also said before, and we can see as an increase and the dispersion band becomes smaller, the critical properties uh, still remains in remains the university of, of the 3D and the central system, um, at least up to n equal to three. We just did uh, just did uh, up to three. And the trend we can we also can see the change from 3D dispersive band with an MIT to a solely 1D system without MIT is not a continuous change, but there is an eventual replacement and the shaking of a dispersive band by a pro proliferation of a flat band as N grows. Oh. There is the last part of the acknowledgement. Thanks, thanks to Professor Rudolf Aroma and the Professor Xinxin Zhong for the guidance. And thank you, my partner, Xiaoyi Mao. And uh, thanks, thanks all the teacher and the students present for the question and the listening. Thank you, thank you all as well. Thank you, Jiu. Uh, thank you. Time for a couple of quick questions. Christian. Okay. I need to activate my, uh, my microphone, okay. Yes, no, 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 nice talk, okay. I just uh, wonder whether you have studied what is happening uh, or you plan to study what is happening exactly at a critical point, the so-called uh, wave function multifractality. Sorry, can you please, I cannot catch your, what you said. Okay. Uh, do you uh, okay? Did you study, or do you plan to study what happens exactly at the critical point of the transition between the uh, extended and localized uh, phases, namely the multifractality of the wave functions? When you are exactly at the critical point, okay, the wave function no longer, no longer extended or uh, localized. They have a multifractal uh, uh, structure. Say, did you do you have you studied that or not? No, maybe not. Wait. So, uh, sorry, I cannot. Oh, it's okay. And this, it's okay. I cannot understand your question. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe you maybe you you can read uh, because I send a question to everyone. Maybe you can look. Wave function multifraction. Oh, sorry, we didn't do the wave function multifraction. We do the localization lens. Yeah. Yeah. We do okay. the look. Okay, Andreas. Okay, um, this, uh, I, I believe it's a pretty naive question. Uh, uh, in the end, it's about uh, where the flat bands are located in the energy spectrum. And uh, so I would say that if you have a perfectly flat band, um, then shouldn't such a perfectly flat band be uh, sensitive to an infinite amount of disorder? And furthermore, shouldn't a flat band uh, favor um, um, localization so um but on the other hand you're getting uh, so, uh, some pretty big values of the disorder critical values of the disorder where it uh, remains extended um okay i've also written it in the chat short version you can read the chat and i would like to know what you have to say about this
Rudolf, do you want to jump in? Right. Not sure what happened to Gia. Um, yeah, you're perfectly right. Um, these flat bands are, of course, um, heavily localized. I mean, they're what Sergei Flach calls, uh, well, I, I think, now they have a special name for that, which I can't think about. So they're, they're clearly localized. So the question here wasn't so much what happens to those flat bands which are localized, but what happens to the extended states when you already have, even at weak disorder, sort of this highly localized states next to them. So that was really what we what we sort of were trying to look into. And maybe while I'm here, I'm also answering Christian's question, maybe come up with a question on my own. We haven't done multifactility. Of course, you can do it at all these transitions. Uh, and from the phase diagrams you've seen, you have many transitions. But I would expect it's at each transition point to be exactly the same as the normal Anderson. So why would that be interesting? I can't hear you. Sorry, you're still mute. No, no, no. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm just asking. I mean, just just if you did a check yeah. at some point, at one point, I understand. Huh? I'm just. Uh... No, you could do it, but of course, then. I mean, it's a different study, right? Instead of transformatics, you would have to do a proper diagonalization study at these systems. Sure. I'm sure it's something sure. that could be done, yes. But my naive expectation, which can be wrong, would be that you just get the same spectrum that you get at the normal Anderson transition. No, probably yes, probably yes. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's all open up our mics and give a round of applause to all the uh, speakers. Hello everyone, uh, I am Dhiman Bhumik, I am from Nanyang Technical University. Today I am going to discuss about my work in topological magnets in flux state of Sassion lattice. Uh, and this work recently published in PRB and uh, my supervisor is uh, Professor Pinaki Singhupta. So first, uh, here is the outline of the talk. Uh, first, I'll give some uh, previous studies and motivation. Then I'll talk about the spin load lattice uh, and spin model on such a lattice with a corresponding material realization. Next, I'll talk about the method and uh, for to calculate magnon bands. And then I will discuss the magnon bands in two phases, flux state and canted flux state of such a lattice. And finally, I'll uh, give the topological phase diagram in the cantate flux state uh, with thermal hall conductivity and describe the properties of its derivative, also uh, the derivative of thermal hall conductivity. So previously, uh, uh, previously um, it was uh, shown that in uh, triangular lattice in the umbrella phase, there are lots of topological magnon phases uh, can be achieved. And uh, as you can see, the triangular lattice have a umbrella phase, which is at the left-hand side uh, top figure, and lots of topological phases are shown in the uh, below figure, where the three numbers here are the churn number of the three bands, uh, which defines the topology, and they have lots of topological phases available. So, uh, so frustrated lattices are ideal for realization of coplanar, uh, non-coplanar magnetic structure. <clears throat> so triangular lattice is the ideal for that and non coplanar magnetic ordering generally gives a has a uh, rich uh, magnon band topological phases so sassian lattice is one of the frustrated uh, non coplanar lattice which has also uh, realization in the real materials so this is the motivation of that next i will show that uh, the underlying uh, material relation for the uh, spin Hamiltonian I will discuss. So at the low temperature, the rare earth tetraboroid can be uh, described by using the uh, Sassian lattice. Uh, a Sassian lattice is nothing but a, okay, uh, can you see my cursor, anyone? Uh, okay, uh, so uh, Sassian lattice is, uh, nothing but a square lattice uh, which has a extra diagonal bonds and uh, in case of rare earth tetraboroid the heisenberg spin interaction j on the diagonal bonds and heisenberg spin interaction on j prime on the axial bonds are nearly equal which is the origin of the frustration in that lattice and secondly 
for the non copular phase i need a in plane dm interaction for that i need to distort the sasion lattice in a way that uh, the diagonal bonds should be out of plane uh, like this in this figure and secondly uh, even if there is no, uh, out of plane dm interaction but it also can be achieved by uh, using circularly polarized light on the lattice so keeping this all things in the mind we can have a general spin hamiltonian as following where the first line denotes the heisenberg exchange interaction where the j and j prime are the heisenberg interaction on the diagonal and the axial bonds and all the dm interactions are shown in the second line which is also shown in the second figure and <clears throat> for simplicity because there are lots of dm interaction uh, available in this <clears throat> lattice i will say about uh, out of plane i categorize in two families one is out of plane dm interaction and in plane dm interaction for simplicity of the talk and <clears throat> we have a third uh, term which is a gemel like coupling which is due to the magnetic field so uh, uh, the method what i have used is holstein kronk transformation which uh, is useful to calculate the magnon band structure and here are the three steps and which is basically a, a spin to a boson transformation where spin s are the spin operators and a are the Boston boson operators and using this transformation we achieve the tight bending model of magnons and we can diagonalize the mag, uh, uh, hamiltonian for, to get the magnon band structure so the magnon band in the flux state is uh, given as following first the flux state we have like this uh, as uh, shown in the figure at the <coughs> uh, right hand side where the spins at the four lattice sites are perpendicular to each other and it can be achieved by using dm interaction on the axial bonds flux state also can be achievable for the square lattice but uh, the order of magnitude of the dm interaction needs to be equal to the heisenberg interaction which is uh, really unrealistic but due to frustration of the sasion lattice it comes down to 0.6 j the the critical perpendicular dm interaction that need to get the flux state is 0.6 j uh, so it makes the model much more realistic due to frustration and um, so magnon band is flux state is given as shown in the right side figure uh, <clears throat> where um, uh, we, uh, the magnon bands are four uh, uh, there are four magnon bands because there are four sub lattices and uh, all the bands are highly degenerate and uh, the degeneracy is, is due to the symmetry of the system first the mx line is uh, the bands are twofold degenerate along the mx line because of the cramer's degeneracy of this anti unitary operator and bands are also fourfold degenerate at the m point because of another operator and also you can see that there is a gamma point uh, which has a goldstone mode uh, so goldstone mode at the gamma point it is because the system chooses one of the many uh, possible degenerate ground state and breaks the uh, co continuous symmetry spontaneously that's why you have the goldstone mode at the gamma point if we apply a magnetic field it breaks uh, some symmetries and that's why the fourfold degeneracy at the m point leaves and give a twofold uh, uh, so there is a band gap at the m point and we have two bands those are uh, so pair of bands which are degenerate so we can calculate non abelian berry curvature for the uh, pair of bands and here the picture is the non abelian berry curvature for the lower pair of bands but the churn number of the band is zero uh, and that is why uh, we we cannot achieve any uh, topological magnon bands in the cantate flux state so we need cantate uh, sorry in the flux state so we need cantate flux state uh, where the magnon bands uh, are topological in nature to achieve the cantate flux state we need any 
in plane DM interaction, <clears throat> which makes the spins uh, uh, parallel to the diagonal bonds. And uh, the outer plane component of the uh, spins also non-zero, where the crossed circle denotes the spins are in into the plane, has a spin to the plane component and dotted circle denotes the uh, spins also have outer plane component. And the band structure in the uh, cantic flux state is given here, but still all the bands are degenerate and the degeneracy happens at the M point and the X point. And this is because of the symmetry of the system and magnetic field uh, breaks all the symmetries and uh, symmetry, uh, the remaining symmetry are trivial and all bands are gapped. In presence of magnetic field, all bands are gapped and we can calculate the churn numbers. So uh, here is uh, bands for one parameter set and this is the Berry curvature for the uh, lower bands. So here C1, C2, C3, C4 are churn number from lower to upper bands and which I have calculated using the uh, formula, which relates the churn number with the Berry curvature, omega. And the Berry curvature has a relationship with the eigenstate uh, as given by this equation. <clears throat> and so uh, we have calculated topological uh, churn numbers of the four bands for different parameter regions. And um, we get a rich topological phase diagram where the four number associated with each region is, are the churn numbers from uh, lower to upper band. So, and the bar over the number denotes the negative churn number. So one bar means negative one churn number. And also band to, uh, topological regions are separated by the lines which are green uh, sorry, not uh, red, black, and blue in color, which denotes the which band touches during the topological phase transition. And churn number mostly changed by plus minus two during topological transition, and, <clears throat> and the transition happens due to band touching at any other point than gamma point. And if the band touches at uh, gamma point, the uh, churn number changes by plus one. And uh, so we have uh, non-trivial uh, topological magnon bands. So we can calculate the uh, thermal hall conductivity associated with the uh, system. The thermal hall conductivity has an expression like this, which is um, related with the Berry curvature and which is derived by using linear response theory and given in these uh, two references. And so here I have plotted thermal hall conductivity as a function of a magnetic field, the figure A as a function of magnetic field and figure B as a function of inclined DM interaction. And uh, the green, red, and blue color denotes different topological regions. And <clears throat> we can see that uh, the derivative of the thermal hall conductivity has a divergence peak at the band topological transition points. And, uh, uh, means, and this is already well known that there is a divergent at band topological transition point. And this has been shown in, the, in this paper that uh, at the, uh, due to Dirac point, there is a divergence in the derivative of, of uh, thermal hall conductivity, which is logarithmic in nature. In our case, we have lots of topological phase transition and we have showed that uh, this divergence is always logarithmic in nature, either for tilted uh, Dirac point or tilted semi-Dirac points and, okay. <clears throat> tilted Dirac, uh, semi-Dirac points. And uh, the, so it's quite universal. The logarithmic divergence at the band topological transition point is quite universal. And finally, we have derived a expression, a analytical expression for the derivative of thermal hall conductivity near to the band topological transition point, and which has just two parameters, A and, <clears throat> and uh, epsilon naught. And um, 
rho naught is the Bose Einstein distribution, which is a function of epsilon naught. So this expression relates the derivative of thermal hall conductance as a function of temperature. Uh, so we have, uh, and epsilon naught is the energy where the ba uh, band touches during the band topological transition. <clears throat> and uh, so here we have shown this analytical expression is valid uh, and use the numerical data to fit with that analytical expression. And this analytical expression is also applicable for any generic uh, spin Hamiltonian. And it might be useful for experiment that it can get the energy uh, using the uh, derivative of the thermal hall conductance. So we describe the way to realize the non copulant spin structure in the Sassino lattice. And we show that perpendicular DM interaction uh, gives a flux state and in-plane DM interaction <coughs> produces, uh, transform the flux state into the canted flux state. And also magnetic field, in presence of magnetic field, the canted flux state uh, gives us the topological bands and we get a lots of topological phases due to non copenhagen spin configuration and also lots of DM interaction present in the system and we have logarithmic divergence uh, in the thermal hall conductivity and we show that uh, the derivative of thermal hall conductivity which has logarithm divergence has a, a very simple temperature dependence. Uh, uh, thanks, thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Demon. Um, we have one question in the chat. Does anyone else have a question at the moment? Uh, Java, do you have your hand up? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So uh, thanks for your uh, presentation. So uh, one one question regarding to practical of uh, calculation of uh, the, uh, the the Berry curvature. If you back please to one of the slide, you show that formula and you refer to one of uh, PRB paper as I, if I'm not wrong. Uh, for uh, chain number calculation? Yeah, 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 here. So, uh, so sorry, uh, you didn't introduce what is the capital T here and how did you calculate okay. this one? Because as I understood, your, your system has a four, uh, uh, is a, uh, you, have, you have a four atom in the unit cell. It means it's very difficult to find an analytical solution. You have to do this one. Yeah. Normally. And this is a very yeah. challenging point. How did you yeah. manage this one? Okay, so uh, the thing is that uh, the analytical expression here is uh, not gauge independent. So TK vector here are eigenvectors uh, after if you do the Bogolyov of transformation. Uh, and so these are not gauge independent. So you need to transform this uh, gauge, sorry, uh, gauge dependent. So the, you need to transform this gauge dependent formula into gauge independent formula. Uh, and I have not shown that expression, the gauge independent, but it's it's uh, I have uh, shown in this uh, my reference. You can look at this reference uh, that gauge independent formula. It's given in the appendix of that paper. Uh, this uh, what is the the year the, this publication this PRB because you didn't mention the year. Uh, uh, this PRB gives uh, sorry uh, this PRB gives us uh, this formula. Uh, yeah. But uh, to make it gauge independent, I what I have derived is uh, in the in our publication where uh, uh, this paper. Okay. 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 Thank you. Uh, means it's, Thank it's derived in the appendix. Yeah. Thank you. And Thanks. Andreas, Thank you. your question. Um, okay, this is going to be a bit, let's say, more naive. Uh, the uh, uh, the Shasti-Sutherland model is famous for its randomized round state, and. Um, uh, so if I saw correctly uh, that uh, you actually took parameters that would be in the uh, same phase as the square lattice anti magnet for at least for the spin one half model. So first question is, could you confirm that? And uh, then the, the question is, why didn't you just take the uh, simple square lattice anti magnet? Why did you go to, to the uh, shasta southern model? Of course, if my... Okay. Uh... Yeah, so uh, simply square lattice, uh, what I have shown here, okay, uh, simply square lattice don't have this diagonal bond. So uh, 
uh, one thing is that um, uh, this structure we need a in plane dm interaction so but it cannot be po cannot possible a in plane dm interaction with this uh, simple square lattice and secondly yeah so the bands are totally degenerate uh, if we take a square lattice even if there is a canted flux state there is a totally degenerate uh, magnon band so uh, and we cannot calculate the chain numbers from there uh, means the, the bands are not gapped out uh, it's because uh, there cannot be in plane uh, dim interaction and um, yeah, even if you include the in plane dim interaction in presence of magnetic field, uh, means a, then there is always be a uh, gapless point that is the M point, and uh, that is due to the symmetry of the lattice, and uh, that cannot be gapped out. Okay, I think I'll have to stop here. Um, Thanks, thank because you. we have to move on. Thank you very much, Diman, for your talk. As usual, we'll applaud at the end of the session. Uh, can I call the next speaker, Leonardo Benini, who's normally working in Boric, is currently supposed to be in Lyon on a six-month secondment, but will join us because of coronavirus from Italy. <laughs> can you share a screen? Okay, I see your screen. Share my screen? Yes. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Maybe video? I have the video. You don't see my video? Yes, I see it. Perfect. All right. So it should be should be okay. All right, thank you. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being still here. Um, I'd like to present some work that I've been doing under uh, the supervision of Rudolf, and in collaboration with uh, Pierre Nardes and Tomas Rochilde, uh, who are both in France, in Grenoble and Lyon. And this is some work that basically uh, concerns some peculiar dynamical features of strongly localized systems. So quantum many-body systems in the presence of strong disorder. And pretty much everything I'll say has to be uh, framed in the context of closed uh, quantum many-body systems in one dimension. And what we were interested in is the non-equilibrium dynamics of such systems that are decoupled from any external reservoir or external bath. And the simplest way of doing that is by implementing a quantum quench protocol in which you prepare the system in some ground state or an eigenstate of some initial Hamiltonian H that depends on some parameter. And then at time zero, you trigger non-trivial time evolution by switching that value of that parameter to a different one. And this kind of protocols are now easily implemented in a variety of different platforms that go um, under the umbrella term of quantum simulating platforms, like cold atoms loaded into optical lattices or uh, trapped ions uh, trapped by magnetic traps. And what you can do in this kind of simulators is uh, study with a high degrees of accuracy the, the relaxation dynamics of a, few, a very few number of particles initialized in some highly non equilibrium state and following uh, their dynamics into some long time steady state that could be a thermal state. And in that case, we can uh, obtain information about the expectation value of observables and understand its uh, properties through conventional statistical mechanics, or you can have some more exotic phases uh, where the system fails to thermalize in this uh, conventional sense. And I will focus on uh, one of these, uh, let's say, exotic uh, phases, which is the many body localized phase. So, of course, as the, as the name suggests, um, many body localization comes from single particle localization. So, Anderson localization that already someone um, briefly discussed, and I think someone else will discuss uh, in more detail later on. Um, so I just wanted to briefly uh, review what Anderson localization is. Um, it was uh, first described by Anderson in the seminal paper uh, more than 60 years ago, and in, in which he described how the eigenstate of a simple model of free electrons hopping on a lattice with random on-site energies uh, he described how the eigenstates of this model are exponentially localized, meaning that the wave function of your particles are exponentially suppressed far from a, a, an initial uh, localization point in space. And this is true for whatever the disorder is in one dimension and two dimension. And so you have uh, a perfect insulator where disorder induces the suppression of diffusion and transport. 
Or in three dimension, you can have a proper quantum phase transition, meaning that below a certain critical disorder trying to, to see you have diffusive behavior and above that you have localization, proper localization. So what happened like uh, 15 years ago uh, is that Bosco Langer and Al Schuller um, published a paper uh, in which they tried through the means of, perturb of perturbation theory calculation to, to probe the stability, the robustness of ANS localization uh, in the presence of interactions between the particles. And they showed indeed that uh, localization survived the, 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 the addition of interactions and proposed the existence of a transition even in one dimension between uh, ergodic and extended states even in one dimension uh, to localized states in the many body scenario. And this gave rise to give birth to the field of many body localization which is now quite quite active and here you can find uh, four of the most recent reviews on the topics and really uh, a great amount of works have been uh, published in recent years and there has been a rigorous proof um, by Imre in 2014 of the existence of this MBL phase in some specific spin systems and most of the works are actually uh, numerical works that uh, describe it in very much detail a lot of interesting properties of MBL states like uh, Poisson level statistics of energy level spacing uh, in the spectrum of MBL Hamiltonians uh, weak degree of entanglement even in excited states in the spectrum as opposed to ergodic systems where you have uh, a high degree of entanglement and the characteristic feature of MBL has been uh, identified in this in a slow dephasing dynamics due to the interactions that leads to uh, a slow growth of entanglement in time uh, as the logarithm of time actually as opposed to endless localization where there's no uh, and, um, entanglement generation. And also it has been um, subject of a uh, variety of uh, experimental protocols uh, trying to probe the existence, the existence of MBL and the failure of thermalization in this kind of phase, mainly in the context of cold atoms. So what we did was study the quench dynamics of the paradigmatic model used in MBL studies, which is the Heisenberg spin half uh, system with an external field that can be of, let's say, two different, two different cases. In the first one, this external field along Z is taken to be random, like in the conventional Anderson model. And the second case is represented by the quasi-periodic uh, case, where you basically have a periodic potential profile along your chain, but with the period which is incommensurate with the lattice spacing of your system. So usually what you do is take this k inside this cosine to be irrational, an irrational number, and it has been proven uh, even at the single particle level by a famous work by Aubrey Andre, but also in the many body cases, which are these two papers here, uh, that both these models show uh, an MBL transition in, across the spectrum uh, between ergodic states and MBL states. So at some point, some specific disorder strength delta, you can have, depending on the energy in the spectrum you're at, uh, some ergodic behavior or MBL uh, behavior. So what we do is we prepare the system in an initial product state, an entangled state, uh, up, down, up, down, up, down, or if you want to think in particle language, uh, in a charge density wave state, where you have the particle density distributed every two sides. And our main observable is a quantity which is related to the overlap between the state evolved time t, evolved under the action of the Hamiltonian H at different disorder strength delta, and the initial state in which we initialize our system. And the associated probability to this object is called, it has many names, but it, uh, I'm going to stick to terminology used recently and call it Rojmit Eko. And it's basically just a measure of somehow how, how similar your state is to your initial state. So what you expect usually if the system thermalizes is that if you prepare it in this highly non-equilibrium state and you let it free to evolve under the action of some time-independent Hamiltonian, what you get is basically a loss of information about the initial configuration of your system. And a good measure of this is the so-called so imbalance, which is here uh, written its spin variation, that basically measure the staggered magnetization at each side i. 
And it's a good measure of uh, thermalization because at time zero, uh, since we initialized our system in a product state, in a product antiferromagnetic state, it starts with a, a value of one. And then if the system thermalizes and the initial ordering is lost, you get a vanishing of the imbalance in the long time limit. And increasing the disorder strength, the imbalance stays close to unity and it stays there for uh, a very long time at least. So this is exactly what we see in our numerical simulation. This is, these are not really new results. This has been also observed in experiments. But you can see here as an example that increasing the disorder strength, the imbalance stays close to unity, meaning that it keeps some memory of the initial configuration that we initialize our system into. And I'd like to point out also the oscillations that the imbalance, basically damp oscillations that the imbalance develops when you enter in the, short, in the strong disorder regime. What we did then was uh, calculate our Lodgmeet A observable and actually uh, a related quantity, which is uh, called Lodgmeet return rate, which is just the minus the logarithm of the Lodgmeet echo. And this is basically our first uh, result, uh, is our the observation that, uh, well, consistently with the imbalance, of course, also this measure um, signals uh, a similarity of the both state with the initial state as strong disorders, as you see the logarithm of the Lodgmeet echo stays closer, uh, stays closer to zero, yeah. So there's a, a smaller at strong disorder compared to the weak disorder regime. But the most interesting feature here, uh, I believe, is the emergence of this uh, singular structure of cusps in time that repeats periodically at the well-defined times. And what's even more interesting is that the imbalance uh, oscillations has exactly the same period of the recurrent cusps that emerge in the logic echo dynamics. So if you want this uh, as a phenomenological observation is a sharp signature um, that emerges in the strongly localized regime, which is also experimentally uh, measurable. Two in minutes, that. Leo. How much? Two. Two, okay. Okay, uh, so then we try to describe with some analytical formulation uh, the emergence of these uh, singularities. And what we did was uh, imagine, the general idea here is that in the strong disorder regime, you have your potential profile that subdivide your system in multiple wells, in multiple clusters that are well separated between each other, meaning that the, the hopping between them is negligible. And in that limit, the, the, the the dynamics is locally governed by particle diffusion over a small number of sites. And if you take this idea to the extreme and you consider only clusters comprising two sites, you can build up a very simple model of independently oscillating two level systems that undergo some rabbit type oscillation with a frequency depending on the hopping and on the local detunings between the two sides, which is just the difference in energy uh, between the two sides. And if you solve the rabbit problem and you obtain the probability of having the particle in one side or the other, this is exactly equivalent to the Lodgmeet echo that we want to calculate in this simple framework. And if you know the probability distribution of all the detunings across the chain, which is possible to extract uh, by numerical sampling or by analytical consideration, you get this integral form for the Lodgmeet return rate. And solving that, uh, which we solved that uh, numerically, this interval, and we compare the results with the exact analyzation results that I showed you earlier. And you can see that basically at strong disorder, uh, when the, when the Lodgmeet echo starts developing this uh, non-analytic structure, our results are exactly predicted uh, by the two sides, this, two, this very simple two sides model of localization. Um, well, I probably don't have time for this, but we also uh, probed the power of this simple approach by calculating also other observables, not, that, not just the Lodgmeet echo, we have some results regarding entanglement, and in particular, one contribution to the total entanglement entropy of your system, which is the number entropy, which is basically just related to the hopping of particles across the cut you make uh, along your chain. And what we, we probed is that you can extract a formula, an analytical formula for the number entropy uh, in the two sides model that basically very well agrees with the prediction uh, of the, no, with the numerical results. So uh, I think I have to conclude now. Um, 
basically we showed some sharp signature of um, in the Lockheed echodynamics that could be a good measure, a uh, good um, signal of localization, uh, even from an experimental uh, point of view. And we built some simple analytical model that is able to capture not just the Lockheed dynamics, but also the behavior of other quantities of, in of interest. And that basically provides some analytical formulas uh, for the um, calculation of observables in the many body localized regime, which is not something uh, which is usually attainable. And so with that, I uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the attention. Okay, thank you very much, Leo. Questions, please. Pinaki, you already have one in the chat. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, Leo, for a nice talk. What is the ratio of uh, JZ over JXY that you are using? Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, uh, both, both of them are, are one. I, I said uh, I'm all at one. Basically. Does having uh, an anisotropy have any effect? Uh, well, you, yeah, usually change in the interaction strength JZ basically changes the, the value of, the, I mean, changes the position of the mobility edge across the spectrum. Um, so you can think uh, about many-band localization as dependent on the disorder strength, or you can fix the disorder strength and just change the interaction to get the mobility edge moving across the the parameter space, but um, for this case, we just took the, the, the simplest, the simplest uh, case, and we just put both of them to one. Leo, there is a question by Andrea De Luca. Andrea, uh, yes, I, I probably you explained it, but I missed. Uh, how do you compute the distribution of p of delta in your two sides model? So for the quasi periodic potential, uh, there is this uh, result. Sorry. There is this result from Guerrero and collaborators. It's actually an experimental paper. And um, by some geometric consideration, you can get this analytical form for the quasi-periodic potential distribution, which is here showed in the, in the blue curve. So, it, and this delta is some renormalized delta that comprises some other stuff. But if you go there, there's the, the full derivation of this form. While for the random potential, you can just numerically sample that, but it's easy to see that it's just a triangular function. And it, but when you say you sample, what, what is that you sample in practice? Uh, you sample a long chain, a, long, a, a very long chain with a two side, and I just calculate the potential profile at each side, and then I calculate the probability distribution of having two addition, um, of having uh, energy difference, delta J. So you just calculate the probability distribution of having delta as an energy difference between two consecutive sides. So, so you get a tri triangular shape because you had the uniform disorder. Yeah, yeah, it's uniform. The random. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, so you don't need to sample that. That's you can compute it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. But in this, okay, thanks. It's just because in this plot, I just showed it uh, numerically sampled. But yeah, you can, you can, you can extract it in uh, different ways. Final question by Christian Miniatura. Yeah, sorry, I mean, this is a very naive question because I am not well versed in many body localization. But anyway, when, when you consider Anderson localization, I mean, generally, when you have a very, very strong disorder, it's, I would say it's kind of, kind of trivial, no? I would say. Because you can have the particle traps in the lowest, I mean, wells, okay, and then, uh, and that's it, yeah. okay? So, so here, are, okay, how? Well, here you have spins, of course, I mean, uh, so this model, but how would you distinguish between, I mean, a, lo a trivial localization because you have, I mean, very deep wells and the uh, more subtle one uh, with uh, the interference that are broken and that breaks, I mean, the transport. Uh, <clears throat> not, not sure what you mean by trivial localization. You mean just a, that a strong disorder Everything is uh, well, par particle in box. You put particle in the box. They cannot. They cannot op, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. This is yeah. That is basically what we did here with this simple model. But uh, yes, I agreed. But but Anderson localization can be uh, is something else. I would say. Um, okay, this is a good point. Um, I wouldn't really know how to how to frame this in, uh, in this context. Um, well, no, no, if, yeah. I, if I may chip in, I, th I think what Leo has done is 
with the Rabi oscillations, he has been able to describe, just like Christian was saying, basically what happens in the strong disorder limit, not just you sit in the lowest potential, but the next thing is sort of when you want to try to get out, you get these Rabi oscillations. Yes. Right. Yes. And this, and he has basically shown what is one limit of many body localization, but also in general localization. That's the strong disorder limit. Yes. Right. And, and of course, numerically, you can go also into the weak disorder limit. Yes. So basically, the numerics goes all across. And somewhere in between, you will have, you have the Anderson localization results, which are the ones for the imbalance and um, the en entropy and all this that you showed. But at least the limit for very strong disorder, we can also show it analytically here. OK, this was the last question. So I think we should come to the next speaker which, if I'm not mistaken, is Andrea De Luca. Yes. Andrea, can you share a screen, please? Yes. OK, I see the presentation. OK. And I see it in full screen mode. Go ahead. Okay, so welcome everybody and thanks, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about some work that I've been doing in the last couple of years and which is uh, connected to the topic of uh, quantum chaos and essentially its definition in uh, many body systems. Um, so I will start with a brief introduction which is more or less connected with what uh, Leo just mentioned before. So this talk uh, concerns about the dynamics of closed quantum systems. And uh, there are a couple of uh, fundamental questions which can be raised for these systems, which is essentially how does an isolated many body system thermalize? So we are all taught in undergraduate courses that uh, whenever a system is in contact with an external reservoir, it can exchange conserved quantities like energy and particles. And in this way, it reaches a Gibbs state. But if the system is isolated, you cannot use this kind of argument. So you have to use its own dynamics to reach an equilibrium state. And essentially the thermalization means the fact that the system is able to lose memory of its initial condition. And uh, so the questions that one can raise are, uh, do we see some form of universality for the way in which system thermalize? And uh, if they thermalize, how, um, if we know how thermalization occurs, do we know any way to avoid thermalization? So Leo mentioned the MBL as one possible mechanism. There are others which have been found in the literature. And if thermalization can be avoided, maybe one can find different out of equilibrium phases. Uh, of course, the motivation to try to answer this kind of question nowadays, these are of course very old questions, is, uh, comes from experiments because nowadays we have cold atoms, trapped ions, which are all platform, which um, uh, allows us to study systems which are essentially isolated for sufficiently long time for thermalization uh, to occur. Um, so the first thing which I would like to observe is that um, the fact that the system is thermalizing is connected with the, the production of entanglement. And this can be quite easily observed if we take as a big system. So my system is closed, but I can imagine that it is composed by two parts, call it A and B. And I'm considering now the, the reduced density matrix of the system A, which is just tra obtained by tracing B from the, the full uh, state of my system, which is just Psi. And the, the, the point is that if the system is thermalizing, the, the, the reduced density matrix uh, rho A must be exactly given by uh, tracing B from a Gibbs distribution. But if you now apply this argument to the computation of the entanglement entropy, you see that even if the initial state had no entanglement, at long time, what happens is that the von Neumann entropy, which I'm writing here, um, will be given by the thermodynamic entropy. So in what is going on here is that you started from a state which had very low entanglement, and you end up with a state which has uh, an extensive entropy and so an extensive amount of entanglement since just because the, um, the von Neumann entropy has to reproduce the thermodynamic one. Now the problem is, so this is a very simple argument which doesn't need any calculation, but of course one would like to go beyond that, beyond that and uh, saying something specific to models which are relevant for experiments, but this becomes problematic because Thermalization requires to be away from the ground state because you want to be in a highly excited state. 
and to have strong interactions because this is a non-perturbative phenomenon. And so essentially all the very, uh, the techniques that we normally use for this kind of problems uh, cannot be applied. So what people have been doing are either using solvable models like free theories or Betean's and integrable models on, on one side, or numerical methods, which are essentially DMRG-like uh, methods, so tensor networks, or exact diagramization. The problem is that both these approaches have limitations, so clearly integrable models have to be fine-tuned, and they are non-ergodic by definition. And on the other side, uh, exact diagonalization is restricted to small sizes, and DMRG is restricted to small times. So we have limitation in all these kind of approaches. But nevertheless, we learned something. Uh, so let me start with, from what we learned from uh, integrable theories. So how does this production entanglement appears? And uh, this come, goes back, sorry, this go back, goes back to some results of Calabrese and Cardio 2005, which had been uh, then extended to many other cases more recently. And the idea is that the reason why we, we see all this entanglement to be produced is because the initial state behaves like a reservoir of quasi-particle pairs. So from each point, there is a pair, and the two quasi-particles are traveling in opposite direction. And so what happens is that you see a lot of entanglement appearing between A and B because at the end of the, after some time evolution, these pairs will be separated, having one particle in B and one particle in A. And so from this, you, you can simply have a formula for the entanglement entropy, which gives you a linear growth. Now, uh, this is a nice argument, and, but of course this is completely based on the fact that you can describe your dynamics in terms of quasi-particles. This is not possible in general, and uh, this is an example, uh, I will not go into the details, but this is a, a paper of 2013 where this, the authors consider numerically a model in which quasi-particles are not very well defined, and in particular, they chose the parameters such that the transport of energy was diffusive, so you don't expect ballistic transport of quasi-particles. Um, but nevertheless, the entanglement was growing linearly, so it seems like entanglement is growing linearly even though there is no, no real ballistic transport. And so to summarize uh, these kind of observations, we more or less understand what happens for integrable models. There is dephasing of quasi-particles, which produces relaxation to something, uh, we'll not go into the details for reason of times, but this system do not thermalize to a Gibbs ensemble but to something else, but still you observe linear growth of entanglement and typically ballistic transport. And on the other side, we have chaotic or ergodic systems, which do thermalize to, or we expect them to thermalize to the Gibbs ensemble. The entanglement is still growing linearly and transport is typically diffusive. So, as I said, it's uh, hard to, to study really ergodic and chaotic systems because of the limitation I uh, explained so far. And so what we proposed um, is to use somehow random matrices and I will explain uh, how we, we try to use random matrices in this context. So the use of random matrices goes back to the 60s and it was an idea of Wigner uh, to use them to explain the experiments about collision of heavy nuclei. And so in this kind of collisions, you have uh, something nuclei which, which contains something like 100 nucleons. In principle, you can write down the Hamiltonian, but you can never diagonalize it. And so the position of these peaks in the experiments cannot be found even numerically, even nowadays. And uh, so the idea of Wigner was, uh, okay, as we did from, uh, for statistical mechanics, where we forgot the, the possibility, we, we decided not to care about the specific state of the system. Here we do the same, but we even forget about the real Hamiltonian of the system and we replace it with a random matrix. So that's what he did. Of course, this approach will not give you the details. So we will not, you will never get the exact position of the peaks, but what you can get, what you can get are statistical properties, like for instance, the distribution of the gaps between these peaks. And what you observe is that this kind of calculation matched quite well with experiments in particular, uh, you see this effect of lever repulsion in the sense that the peaks are never too close one to the other. And so this is the so-called Wigner-Dyson distribution where, which goes to zero in zero. And it contrasts with the Poisson distribution, which is what you obtain for independent uh, energy levels. So this kind of idea became somehow the fingerprint of quantum chaos so that there was a conjecture in 1984 
which said that at the level of single particles, whenever you quantize a, a, an integrable billiard, you will get a Poisson energy level distribution. And whenever you quantize a non-integrable billiard, you get a big Dyson distribution. This was at the level of single particle, but it actually applies also to the level of many body systems. This is just an example for the a variant of the XXZ spin chain where you add on the second line integrability breaking term. And you see that you immediately go from the, the Poisson distribution at J prime equals zero to the Wigner Dyson distribution when J prime is finite. And uh, so I would just want to clarify how we observe this kind of level repulsion for random matrices. So um, I will introduce a very simple model. This is a model in which you, you just do a flow K evolution. So the time is discrete. And every time you want to add the new time step, you just apply uh, the same matrix, call it W, which is just obtained from the Haar unitary ensemble. So I just take a big random matrix from the Haar ensemble and I apply it repeatedly to my state to generate evolution. So of course, uh, now I want to see how level repulsion emerges in this model. This is particularly simple because I don't have an Hamiltonian. I just have a, I'm evolution operator, so there is no energy conservation. Uh, but still, I can compute a spectrum for this model, and uh, I will get that, um, the, of course, the spectrum of a unit operator are uh, phases, which lie on the unit circle, and I can compute their distribution, which is this function rho theta. So to observe the level, the repulsion, what you have to do is look at the correlation function between rho theta and rho theta plus omega, which is in the literature is called as, uh, is defined as R of omega, and I will not go into details, but for technical reason, it is useful to look at the Fourier transform of this function, which is known as the spectrum form factor. So it takes this uh, simple form of being uh, the product of two traces, W to the T and W dagger to the T. And uh, whenever you, you, once you have done this kind of mapping, the result, uh, I will not go into the details of the calculation, but the result is that the K of T has a very simple form. It is just a ramp, a linear ramp, which saturates at the size of the of the matrix. So you just see T and then N when T, uh, when T is larger than N. And if you go back to the Fourier transform, you see the tar of omega is exactly this kind of shape when you see this as this uh, dip when omega is close to zero, which exactly signals level repulsion. So essentially a linear K of T is exactly signaling uh, level repulsion. Uh, okay, so random matrices capture the universality of the level spacing uh, for chaotic systems, but of course that's not everything we want because there is another important notion which is locality. We know that in a 1D system, whenever you flip a spin, it takes some time to propagate to the rest of the system. And so what we, we tried was to extend to another class of models which somehow tries to combine um, random matrices with locality. And these are go, go under the name of random circuits model. And in particular, in uh, our case, what we did was considering the Floquet okay random circuits model. So these are models, uh, I will just explain quickly what they are. These are models in which you, you still use random matrices. So you have uh, two, two sides gates, which I'm calling here as U's, and you're applying them in a brick wall geometry. You first apply one layer to the odd even uh, sites, and then a second layer to the either, um, uh, even odd sites. And then you repeat the same layers of random matrices. So for this reason, this is once again a Floquet time evolution. And uh, so I will uh, um, give you um, more or less just a sketch of what, what is the result that you obtain for this kind of models. So by considering two extreme limits. So as I said, if I have a many body system which is evolved by a single um, uh, random matrix, then uh, the spectrum for factor is expected to be simply linear. As I said, because this is exactly the same calculation I explained to you before. So it's linear up to a time uh, Q to the L. Here Q, Q is just the local inverse space dimension that I'm considering. So on the contrary, if instead these spins are completely decoupled, then what you observe is that uh, the spectrum for factor is factorized on each spin, and so you get the T to the L. And so in reality, if you do numerical simulation, you exactly see a crossover between these two regimes. On the short time, you see a an, an fast growth, T to the L, and then it goes to a linear growth at larger times. So essentially you see a random matrix behavior emerging at this uh, large time, 
but you see also short time behavior, which is sensitive to the fact that the system has local interaction. So it takes some time to show chaotic behavior. And there is a transition time between these two regimes, which, is, which goes under the name of Taoist time. And so um, to summarize uh, more or less what this observation is about, uh, you can compute it exactly in the model, which I just explained to you. The idea is that you have this function k of t in a many body extended system, which looks like with time you have a growing length, which is the, the length at which the system looks chaotic. And so when um, this length is called psi in my notation, so for a given value of psi, the system can be imaged in to be partitioned in many of these uh, um, um, patches. And each of these patches behave chaotically. And so that's why you observe uh, a k of t, which is like something like t to the l divided by the size of each of these patches. And when the patches, uh, the size of these patches reaches the, 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 the size of the system itself, then you really see random matrix behavior. And the crossover between these two is the tallest time, which is when the, this length scale, psi of t, is equal to the system psi l. And uh, with this, I can uh, just conclude more or less my presentation. So uh, the idea is that um, this Floquet random circuits model provides you a platform to make analytic calculations for uh, chaotic models, which is something which is normally not so easy. And the nice thing is that they can retain uh, a few nice properties, like you can still use the technology of random matrices, but at the same time, um, you can uh, still retain locality, which is another important ingredient. Um, so there are some important uh, effects which I didn't mention. I only spoke about 1D, but you can extend these kind of models to higher dimensions. And uh, at the same time, uh, other effects which we studied and I didn't mention, which, which are related to the previous talk, are what happens if you go towards many body localization. And with hey. this, I can thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Andreas. Are there any questions? Oops, Java, do you have a question? Yes. Uh, hi, Luca, thank you for your nice presentation. Hi. Hi. Uh, one question. So uh, this idea of using the random matrix uh, theory to mimic uh, some real systems. So yeah. what, I, what I didn't get exactly, how you can model some specific uh, Hamiltonian with this type of uh, very general random matrix approach for look at you proposed here. For example, if you want to mimic the behavior of what you've shown as a chaotic system in one of your um, present uh, transparency, if you back, you, you prepare one uh, Hamiltonian model, J1 and J1 prime. With yes, you're referring to this one, yes. Yeah, for, ex uh, here. for example, this one, how you can uh, you know, I didn't get how you can define the, this model Hamiltonian for uh, for with this uh, random matrix approach you proposed. So, okay, the, the, the simple answer is that this is these are simple models. These random matrices model are models which are supposed to be toy models. So you introduce them because you can more or less solve them and. Uh, they give you general principles that you can then apply to particular models. So for instance, these models tell you that entanglement is supposed to grow linear, linearly. Mm -hmm. But of course, then you, if you want to relate the velocity at which entanglement is growing with the specific models, then you really need to, to go into the specific details of the, spe of the model. So then, of course, mm -hmm. as you were saying, this will depend on the coupling J prime and all these features. So in general, there is, it's not easy to connect this kind of results with a specific model. Nevertheless, more recently, there have been attempts to make this more systematic. So for instance, you take the model uh, that's written, written here and uh, you do an expansion in the spin size and um, but still by keeping the model chaotic. Um, so you don't want to go to a classical limit, of course. So you have to do it properly. And you can write down an expansion in this sense in which the leading order would be some random matrix. And then you have correction on top of it. Mm -hmm. So this is hey, possible, have... but it's not, uh, um, as I said, the, the, the principle is a little bit different. So yeah. you want to find general, general ideas. 
We have one more question. Thank you. Torcini. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao Andrea. Alessandro. Uh, can you go to the last slide? Yes. yes. So, no, the other one. This. No, this one, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Maybe I misunderstood as usual, but uh, uh, C here has a role of a correlation length. Uh, you, well, it's a correlation length in some sense, but it's a, it's a correlation length uh, that you observe in the energy spectrum. In the energy spectrum. Eh? Because so it's not it's not related it's not related to the space somehow. Or yes. No. It isn't. So essentially, what's the point here? You. If the system is somehow separated in uh, um, patches which do not talk to each other, yes. but if each of these patches was chaotic, then you would expect uh, the chaotic behavior inside each of these patches. But of course, you cannot expect a level repulsion between okay. uh, un unrelated systems. So what we are saying here is that, of course, now, if you have uh, local interactions, it's not that immediately every spin is talking with every other spin. It takes okay. some time for this to happen, and uh, this is the okay. sense in which this correlation length, as you want to call it. No, no, but a, I think it's exactly the, what I have in mind, the part of the space we are estimating it. So, somehow L over C give you the, dim the true dimension of a system. Uh, L over C is, a, <laughs> you want, is the number of degrees of freedom which are still uncovered. Exactly, it's the fractal dimension. You are estimating the fractal dimension here somehow. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that could be. I right. don't know if you know this literature because this is exactly <laughs> what I've done in my master thesis in 90. Uh, so <laughs> it's L divided by correlation, not only me, but it was a lot of literature. If you have the nearest neighbors, so you can give an estimation of a fractal dimension L divided by C. Well, I, I'm not sure it is easy to interpret it as a fractal dimension because, of course, the system is, is one dimension here. It's the, the fractal dimension, this kind of... No, 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 no. Maybe, maybe you misunderstood. Okay. Uh, so you have a length L, so it's the number of neighbors. Uh, so suppose you have a, di a density dimension, sorry, like uh, 0.5. Yes. So your true dimension is L divided by 2. Okay. C... Uh, is the, somehow the inverse of the density dimension, I would say. Okay, we, we can speak again. See why is changing in time? Because uh, um, so C will not change in time if you, you if you really the system was not chaotic. So up to you, you can couple a few. So suppose you have some localization length. So inside this yes. volume, can I also change something in time? Can I ask you to to? to um, discuss in private if that yeah. is possible because we should move on okay okay yes yes okay i mean okay thanks thanks for the question excellent um but there is um poor christian um miniatura waiting for us to actually okay. talk so thanks. can i get you to share your screen christian yes you can and Andrea, I think you have to stop because I now we can read all your emails if that's not. <laughs> okay, we can hear you, we can see you, Christian. Please take it away. Okay, okay, so let me just um, do something. I don't wait. Uh, sorry, um, just a uh, small, small detail. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm back. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. Okay, so can I start now? Yes, please. Okay, so um, okay, my talk will be along the lines of uh, Anderson localization and also, I mean, finite size scaling and uh, even this correlation uh, length that you were discussing. Okay. So uh, let, let me uh, just briefly recall for, for some of the people who do not know. Okay, what are the f various phenomena for waves in disordered media? Just in a nutshell. So, in fact, uh, uh, when you start with a wave, you, you can just describe it as a particle in, in first place, I would say, and then you have a, a pinball wizard game. Okay, and uh, the, what you get is a random work in the end. And from a, if you want to, to write down di diagrams using propagators and so on, 
This is a so-called ladder approximation where you have co-propagating amplitude and you sum over all possible amplitudes, okay? But of course, I mean, in this description, you discard all the interferences and there is a twist, of course, because there is the, the effect of loops, okay? And these loops mean that you do have, the interference do play a role. And this is witnessed, for example, in the weak localization correction or coherent backscattering, uh, which uh, happens in the form of a, of a peak in the, in the reflected light or, or wave uh, intensity. And this uh, CBS peak, for example, is explained by a crossing and you can just incorporate into the theory, in the, in the diagrammatic theory, using these maximally crossed diagrams. But of course, I mean, the, this pinball is, plays mean pinball, okay? And interference can break transport under right conditions, and you are going to strong localization under some localization, which is a disorder-driven metal insulator transition. So this is what I am interested in. And what I will focus on is the 3D Anderson metal insulator transition, where you have, I mean, I, uh, localized eigenstates are separated from extended one through, I mean, a mobility edge. And I remind here that at the mobility edge, you have, of course, a di divergence of the localization length, the typical size of, of the localized wave function, and the diffusion constant uh, that you find, the, the, this diffusion motion, uh, on the metallic side, okay? And it turns out that you have two exponents, mu and, and s, and in fact, they turn to be, uh, out to be equal for d equals three. Uh, three. This is a, known as the Wegener's rule. Okay. So uh, the, the question we, so this, all of this is very well known, but uh, we were interested in cold atom experiments, and we, we knew that in cold atom experiment, the people know how to measure very precisely the momentum distribution. And so we wanted to know if we could have any signature of Anderson localization that in momentum space, knowing that the, the disorder is spatial. So here I just describe how you can do that numerically. Okay, you have an, uh, an, the usual uh, Schrodinger Hamiltonian with a static random potential D of R, which can be an optical laser speckle in an, in an experiment that you can also model uh, from a numerical point of view, any, any type of disorder that you, you may fancy. So what is the, the experiment we want to do? We want to start with a plane wave state, K0. And then of course we implement the random evolution with H for a given uh, random configuration. Of course, I mean, because we start from a, a plane wave and, and then we apply abruptly the, the random potential, in fact, be, there will be a, a, a spreading uh, of energies, okay? And this is described by the so-called uh, spectral function. So in order to, to avoid blurring of all the quantities we want to compute by this energy spread, we need to do some energy filtering. And so on, on, on in the numerics, we apply this uh, Gaussian filtering operator. Uh, you have to know, I don't have time to, de to, to detail, but this is experimentally feasible, in fact. Uh, so, I mean, so this is not just a f f fancy sheer fantasy, okay? So you apply that, so you, you propagate, and then you compute the momentum distribution, the usual way, the squ modulus square of this uh, evolved, I mean, uh, energy filtered state of a K. And you repeat over many disorder configuration, and so you get the average. Okay, so this is very, very uh, straightforward, very simple. So now the question is, what do you see? Okay, so here, I mean, I, I gave, I mean, some numerical results in 2D. So you start from the initial modes, okay? You have plane wave, so this is a delta peak in K space, okay? After a few, a few scatterings, what you see, you see that the initial mode has been depleted and has populated a diffuse, a diffuse ring, okay? That you see here. After some time, you, you start to see the uh, coherent backscattering peak appear here, and the momentum distribution is not yet isotropized. And after some time, again, you get a nice isotropic background, and this would describe the diffusive motion in real space. And you see this CBS, which is an emblematic uh, signature of, of weak localization effects. So far, so good. Uh, just, just let me tell you that this CBS effect is due, in fact, as I said, uh, uh, because of the amplitude of counter-propagating partial amplitudes within the, the disorder configuration. And this is, has been observed also in experiment. This is the, for example, I mean, the figures that I took from a paper in uh, Alain Aspier's group, 
where they start with uh, not a delta peak, a Gaussian peak, kind of, I mean, uh, and, and you see exactly in a real experiment what you observe here. So you may wonder why the CBS peak is so small, because in this experiment, they didn't do this edge energy filtering. Okay, the question is, is that all? And much to our surprise, okay, if you wait long enough, what you see appearing is a new interference peak in the forward direction, and which is a, the twin peak of the CBS effect. And this, of course, signals, I mean, a breakdown of ergodicity, just for localization. And you can show that this new uh, interference peak in momentum space, the coherent forward scattering peak, is a genuine uh, signature of Anderson localization in the bulk. And that the relevant time scale for, for it to appear is associated to the Heisenberg time in a, for localization volume. Okay. So, uh, so we have a marker. So this is very important. And the, the question we have for the following is that, okay, we observe that in a 2D simulation. We know that in 2D, I mean, localization is a, is a rule according to the one parameter scaling hypothesis. So now, I mean, let's go to the 3D and see what happened with the transition. Do, do we have a CFS marking the metallic regime, the, the localized regime? What happens exactly at the transition point? So this is, will be the, what I, I will present you now, okay? So first, we define the CFS contrast as the peak height that you can measure, minus the background, and to choose for the background, you, you just go at perpendicular, okay? And you, and you divide by the background. And this is what we call lambda of T, so the CFS contrast, okay? Okay, so what we claim is that because the CBS and the CFS interference effects, uh, uh, sorry, because the CBS and CFS peaks arise because of interference mechanism, and that this mechanism lead ultimately to localization, they must be sensitive to the nature localized or extended of the eigenstate. So our claim was that the critical properties of the 3D Anderson uh, transition are in fact encoded in the dynamics of the CBS widths. Let me go back a little bit. Why in the widths? Because Just if you five look, minute warning. Yes, yeah, yes. So because when you see the CBS peak, it's already reached a value of two. It does not, it does not change in time, okay? Okay, so, and for the CBS, CFS about the, 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 the contrast, okay? And we want to prove that these are critical quantities in fact, and perform a finite time scaling analysis of it. Okay, I, I won't go into the details of the one parameter scaling and uh, analysis. I mean, JLU, I mean, discussed that already. So let me, let me skip, okay. If you do the analysis for the CBS peak widths, okay, what you see that when you are on the localized side, the width does not change, okay? And the reason is because you can interpret the CBS peak as a kind of a, a young slit experiment where you, the distance between the slit is precisely uh, the, 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 the end points of the scattering seconds. And so if you have localization, does not move anymore, the width stays constant. If you are extended, then this delta of T increases diffusively, and then you get one of the square root of time for, for the width. Okay, and, uh, and, uh, and you can see that here. And exactly at the critical point where you have a subdiffusive behavior with this uh, known exponent one, uh, one third, okay? So once you have that, you have to identify, I mean, the, 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 the finite time scaling, you have to find the scaling uh, variable, so the correlation length, and this is easy to find because in the diffusive side, it will be uh, related to the diffusion constant, okay? and on the localized side by, with the, the localization length. And at the critical point, you expect the, the, const, the contrast to be constant. So you can construct the scaling function and get the, 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 the mobility edge and the exponent of the Anderson transition and GOE class. Okay, so let me go quickly to the, to the CFS dynamics. You can do the same here. We use them in, instead them in the Anderson model. And so on the metallic side, you see at long time, only the CBS, you have no CFS. At the critical point, you have a CBS fully developed and a CFS very small. And in the insulating side, they are both visible and equal, okay? 
So you can do the finite size scaling analysis also of the, of the, of the contrast, construct the, the, the scaling curve. And again, you can extract the critical exponent and, and, the, and the mobility edge. And you can see that you get exactly, I mean, the result that have been obtained uh, for, 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 this, uh, for this model, okay? Okay, so uh, one, one thing that I want to discuss is what is happening exactly at the, at the critical point. Uh, from the form factor that was discussed in the previous uh, uh, lecture, you can define the spectral comp compressibility, which is uh, some limit of the, of, of the form factor. And you can see that in fact, you can show, I don't have time to show you here, that the CFS contract is also given by the, by the form factor. So in fact, what we can infer from that is that the two are equal. And this you can see when, when you look at the contrast as a function of the disorder strengths from different times. And you can see that it goes to a step function, kind of. You have zero on the metallic side, you have one on the insulating side, and a finite value at the critical point, okay? So now there has been a conjecture in, uh, by Bogomolny and Giro in 2010 saying that in fact, the, the, of, uh, at, the, at criticality, the value of the compressibility is related to the information dimension, which is a, 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 um, so a multifactal I mean, uh, dimension in, in the system. So if we use this analogy, uh, this uh, equality with the contrast, CFS contrast, we get a value of D1, which is 1.974, which is very to be compared to the value obtained, in, uh, the best value that I know obtained uh, in the literature with 1.958, okay? So uh, I think I, have, I, I, I am finished. I just want to say that what now we are doing uh, okay, and trying to study is that, can we have uh, signatures of this multifactality behavior in momentum space? Okay, but because this would be nice for cold atom experiments, if you are able to see the, the transition, you could see the transition in, uh, in momentum space with the CFS as a, as a critical marker. And then you could extract at least the D1 uh, dimension. And we are now studying the other di uh, dimensions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Christian. Are, are there any questions? Okay. I don't see a question at the moment. Do I send, see a, a raised hand somewhere? Are the people outside? It's late. Well, okay. No, then, then I have a question. So ah. in principle, you can study the momentum space stuff by simply yes. taking the, the wave function and, and Fourier transforming it, right? So isn't that something you could be doing? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, you would get the same information, right? No? Yes, but because I have six terabytes of Anderson states lying around, <laughs> which, which you could very well take and Fourier transform, and then you see how it looks <laughs> like. Yes, but, but I'm sure you will see. I mean, we have studied in many other system, uh, systems, still called atoms, but with a, a G, a GUE. We have even studied that with this uh, kick rotor system. In fact, the CFS peak has been recently observed in, uh, in kick rotor experiments. Yeah, but I meant, I didn't, I'm, I'm not questioning whether you can observe it or not, but I'm saying basically, if you take my wave functions, um, do the Fourier trans, this is the wave function that gave rise to the paper you quoted on a multifactility, we still have all those, and you could just do the same thing in the momentum space. The question that you basically asked, one should be able to study with these wave functions. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, away. sure, 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 sure. So maybe we'll take that offline some, sometime and, and talk okay. about it. With pleasure, with pleasure. Is there any other question? that anyone is having. Then if that's not the case, then I give back to Andreas. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, I forgot. Then what I want to do is I want to um, unmute everyone. And um, if I can do it, I could do it at some stage. Well, I would like to ask everyone to unmute themselves so we can uh, give a round of applause to all the speakers. Okay. Um, and then I give back to Andreas. Okay. So give us a pause to have some closing comments. And um, well, something I wanted to say is that this is a very special year. So things are not going as planned. 
in particular Rudolf was supposed to be at our place. And um, so um, can you see my uh, shared screen? Yes. So Paris region and we're actually outside here in the upper left corner. And uh, so Rudolf was supposed to be there as uh, part of his, uh, sorry, during his sabbatical and part of his job was to organize a conference that was sent for May. Well, you know, it uh, all came differently. Uh, so Rudolf left, Rudolf wasn't able to stay. And yeah, I think even before that, we had to come to the conference that was uh, supposed to take place. But uh, so let's see whether I can get this here to make it work. So you, um, beyond the rewards, it was supposed to take uh, place down here in the um, Institut d'Etudes uh, Avancées. And um, this is actually a very nice region. And so we have had uh, painters here that are probably known. So I guess everybody knows Vincent van Gogh. Camille Pissarro is a local person. Uh, so he is one of the impressionists. He has one of the paintings uh, that he has uh, painted in the 19th century. And this contours and it still looks a bit like that. And this is a famous picture from Van Gogh. Uh, which is at uh, five kilometers distance or so, and I believe this is a really famous painting. Um, okay, so anyway, since we had to call this off, um, at some point we said it uh, might give us actually the opportunity. Um, so let's make the best of it, uh, of uh, difficult boundary conditions. And um, maybe the fact that we all live in the virtual world now helps to combine people around the world. And uh, so it's, uh, easier from Singapore to switch off, uh, switch on your internet or on the, uh, online than to take a flight to France. And um, so we had this kind of uh, get to know meeting um, in the virtual format with short talks. And I hope, at least my feeling is it went well, I hope uh, the rest of you agrees. And I would like to thank you all for the contributions. And uh, well, we haven't given up the plan yet to hold an on-site meeting but uh, we'll wait until fall uh, before we uh, go more detailed plannings because we really want to have it on site to have you come and visit and maybe also have a bit of uh, looking at the surroundings that are really nice. So with that, um, I would like to thank you all again and uh, hope to see you um, live in, Ser uh, in Sergio Pontoise sometime in 2021, hopefully. So see you all. Thank you, Andreas and Rudo and Francesca, maybe so on behalf of the Institute, I, I would like to thank you again, both uh, you, uh, three, the three people, um, Rudo, you and uh, Francesca for organizing this conference. And I may uh, reiterate in, iterating my invitation to organize an in-person meeting next year uh, into the Institute of um, advanced, for advanced studies in Sergi next year. So keep safe and uh, see you next year, hopefully. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Thanks.